So um, if you can turn in your hymnals to 286, uh, Wonderful Words of Life, we'll sing this song before uh, Pastor Denis Fortin shares with us this afternoon. Um, it's a song that talks about uh, the wonderful truths we find in Scripture and uh, ultimately that we find Jesus the risen Lord in those scriptures. So 286. Thank you so much, uh, Pastor Joe, for the music. All right, um, we just have a couple of minutes before we will start the second afternoon. We have people watching online who are assuming we start about two o'clock. Uh, so uh, I don't want to kind of kick off five minutes earlier. Um, but before um, Pastor Denny Fourteen speaks, does anybody want to give any like, general thoughts on what you heard so far this morning? Was there anything new for you? Was there anything that really said like an aha moment? Was there anything that really challenged your prior thinking on this topic? Um, does anybody want to share uh, any, any kind of moments like this from this morning? Any kind of sea change in thinking or understanding? Well, I'll, I'll share with you something from my side. It was the fact that um, I thought that the second presentation, the first presentation was very clear. The second presentation was starting to articulate a very well laid out case for what often goes to become the papacy and atheism view, but the, the, the change in interpretation, you might say. It was a very well-structured and systematic case. The evidence was well laid out, um, and I really appreciated that this morning. Um, so, did anybody else have like an aha moment or something that they thought, oh, I hadn't thought of that before, or something that's new for them? Oh, good. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm glad that we're all... Uh, advanced scholars then in these areas and um, I'm glad there was nothing new for any of us here this morning but uh, I know I was certainly blessed by both presentations and uh, the thing that strikes me about this is you can have two presentations that don't quite see eye to eye and they're both compelling and, and you just realize that um, as brothers and sisters in Christ we still need to retain the ability to speak things in truth and to still love each other and be respectful with each other even if we don't always see eye to eye on things and I really appreciate that about the, the, the spirit so far this morning of our dialogue. So, um, and with that, I think we can invite Pastor Denis Denis Fortin to come and share with us. Uh, Pastor Denis was the dean of the seminary, and uh, he is uh, back in full-time teaching in the seminary, and we're delighted that he can join us for this afternoon. So thank you, Pastor Denis. Good afternoon. <clears throat> 
I have the unlucky privilege of being the first speaker after lunch and to try to keep you awake. I, and I'll do my best. <laughs> I'll do my best to do this. Uh, thank you for inviting me to uh, present here this afternoon um, uh, at your conference and to say a few things uh, regarding various trends of interpretation uh, regarding the books of Daniel and Revelation, particularly in relationship to historicism. What I'd like to do this afternoon is to do a survey of, of how things have changed and how things are perceived and how those two books are, are understood. Because you know that since our spiritual beginnings in the Millerite movement in the 1840s, so we go back 180 years or so, Seventh-day Adventists have had a very special interest in the books of Daniel and Revelation. And of course, these books, we've studied them together. We have looked at them. We've looked at their symbols, their time periods. We've analyzed everything. We've linked everything together. They, they are really part of the core of our identity and mission. And the fact that this conference is focusing on one chapter of one of the two books uh, speaks as an evidence of our interest uh, in these two books. Of course, Ellen White encouraged us also to study the books of Daniel and Revelation, and that is certainly part of why we are so connected. We have legitimacy to our own uh, outcomes and to our own search uh, for those two books. Nonetheless, it is to be noted that our interest in these two books has a history now going back 200 years since the beginning of the Millerite movement. So that's quite a period of time. I need to make sure that I have the slides here and that we go through. Here's this quote from Ellen White. Daniel and Revelation must be studied, she tells us, as well as the other prophecies of the Old Testament and the New Testament. There's a special need of studying these two uh, books together. We're told that in 1816, so that's 200 years ago, William Miller began his study of the Bible verse by verse. And that two years later in 1818, he came to the conclusion that Jesus would return to earth and destroy the kingdoms of this world in about 25 years, so around the year 1843. It is therefore understandable that during this period of 200 years that Adventist interpretation of the books of Daniel and Revelation has had many twists and turns and ups and downs. It's been 200 years since we've been looking at these two books. We should not be surprised that after 200 years, there should be such a variety of opinions regarding the interpretation of all these details of the books of Daniel and Revelation. My purpose today is to review the history of the interpretation within the Seventh-day Adventist Church. I'm not going to go into the other churches that have looked at Daniel and Revelation, just us, particularly in the last 50 to 75 years. And in my presentation, I seek to present some historical information, some background to help you focus in your conversation on the interpretation of Daniel 11. And knowing some historical trends, perhaps in Adventism, will be helpful and will help you here in your endeavor. Uh, without going any further, though, I want to admit one thing. I am not a specialist in Daniel and Revelation. Uh, that is not what I teach. That is not what I study. I have given Bible studies. I have given seminars on Daniel and Revelation. I have preached sermons on Daniel and Revelation. But I have usually followed the books that I have bought at ABC or the books that I was asked to buy by my teachers when I was in seminary. And so I basically have followed, you know, some of these books. And as I'll tell you about some of my teachers uh, sometimes this afternoon, I have found very few original insights on my own regarding Daniel and Revelation. And when I thought I had, come to find out somebody else had had that insight before me. So I want to say here that I am not approaching this presentation this afternoon as a scholar of Daniel and Revelation. I am looking at it from a historian's perspective as to how we as Adventists have interpreted the books of Daniel and Revelation. And there's a history already after 200 years. But I was very fortunate about um, three or four years ago <clears throat> to be part of a doctoral dissertation committee at the seminary 
of one of our students in Adventist studies who did a study of how the book of Revelation has been interpreted in Adventist thinking in the last hundred years or so. And you know, when you have a student who's doing good things, you just want to cling to what that student has done. And so I was part of, of Gluder Quispies. He is a Peruvian a scholar. He is now the president of our Adventist University in Peru, so Gluder Quispy, and he did a study on the Apocalypse in Seventh-day Adventist interpretation, or the Book of Revelation in Seventh-day Adventist interpretation. And he chronicled, discussed, uh, helped us understand three different emphases on the study of Daniel and Revelation, particularly Revelation, that's, that's his uh, study. So what I'm going to do this afternoon is really borrow heavily from Quispy's study. I was one of his dissertation committee. I went over the book with him or his dissertation two or three times. I made all kinds of comments and helped him, you know, guide him along. So the thoughts I'm sharing with you this afternoon are not really original with me. I'm borrowing them from one of my good students, and I'm sharing with you what I learned from him. And I hopefully these things will be helpful to you as well. Quispy suggests that the history of the Adventist interpretation of the books of Daniel and Revelation can be divided into three historicist methodologies and emphases, three of them. Three emphases. All emphases are historicist. They're, they're all are within that same frame of thinking. But all three emphasize a different approach to how the Bible prophecies are being fulfilled. The first one has to do with the, the most historical one among us. It is an emphasis on the biblical historical understanding of Daniel and Revelation as seen in the writings of William Miller, Uriah Smith, and also much closer to us in time, C. Mervyn Max Maxwell and his book, God Cares. Basically there, what these interpretations or these authors are trying to do is to look at the symbolic events and predictions of the books of Daniel and Revelation and pinpoint which event in history is really fulfilling that detail of prophecy. So it's a, connect, a direct connection here between the Bible and the history. On the one hand, you've got the newspaper. On the other hand, you've got the Bible, and you correspond the two. That's basically Uriah Smith here. That's one emphasis. That's the original one that we have in Adventism. A second one that Quispy discusses is an emphasis that is looking at the exegetical understanding of the books of Daniel and Revelation. It is looking at the Greek, the Hebrew, the Aramaic, at uh, the literary study of the symbols and of the events and the books of Daniel and Revelation, and, and that emphasis there on the literary structures of those books is perhaps found best, uh, first of all, in our SDA Bible commentary on Daniel and Revelation of the 1950s, but much more recently to us, like scholars like John Pauline and Ranko Stefanovic when it comes to Revelation, and the brother Zdravko Stefanovic, Roy Gain, and Jacques Ducan when it comes to the book of Daniel. That's a second emphasis. And I'll go through all three of those in much more detail in a moment. A third emphasis, according to Quispy, is that it is the theological meaning of the prophetic symbols and events that matter much more than trying to find the exact historical uh, in, uh, fulfillment of some of these details of prophecy. And here we have uh, Louis Veer of Australia, and more recently here at the seminary, Hans La Rondelle, who was one of my teachers. And he discussed that methodology very much with, with us, the students, in the mid-1980s uh, when I was a student here. La Rondelle's influence is still very seen today in many of the publications on Daniel and Revelation. So all these scholars here, all of them are historicists, but they all look at the books of Daniel and Revelation from a different angle and a different nuance and a different emphasis. So I, I want to make that clear here. It's not that some are not historicists. They all are, but are just emphasizing something a little differently. So we have three emphases 
of historicist interpretation of Daniel and Revelation. They seek to understand the biblical prophecies, uh, emphasizing either the historical fulfillment or the exegesis of the biblical text in its original languages and within the literary structure of the books, or a third one, the emphasis on the theological meaning of the symbols that are being used within the context here of a great controversy, cosmic conflict. So typically, all emphases, though, arrive at very similar interpretations of Daniel and Revelation, but each naturally will reject some of the interpretations of some of the others. But overall, they are still are in the same ball game, so to speak. So here we go. Let's look at these three emphases. The first one is the biblical historical. It's an emphasis that seeks to fulfill, to discover, to find the historical events that are fulfilling the biblical symbols and the biblical predictions. What exactly is that symbol referring to in history? That's what that emphasis is really trying to, to, to do, to decide. So 200 years ago, William Miller came to the conclusion that the prophecies of Daniel and Revelation would come to a culmination around 1843, 1844. And Miller and his colleagues like Joshua, uh, Josiah Litch, Joshua Himes, Charles Fitch, Samuel Snow, and so many others followed a very distinctive methodology of interpretation of the Bible. And it was based on the presuppositions of Sola Scriptura, the Bible alone. And Miller came to a list of uh, 13, 14 or so various different rules of interpretation. I know this is very small there for you to see, but here in two pages, in, in a memoir about Miller, you've got the 14 rules of interpretation that he gives to be able to interpret Daniel and Revelation. And honestly, he, works with, he worked within the established Protestant system of interpretation and mindset of his time. He was very conscious of this. He believed this. He, in, he imported this into his views. He used the Protestant principle of taking the Bible as its own interpreter and looking in the other pages of the Bible for the understanding of symbols of some other books. So you just compare Scripture with Scripture, and the more you do this carefully, you will find exactly what this is all about. So the, an, an analogy and the typology of the symbols of the books of Daniel and Revelation will lead to the, understanding the meaning of those symbols. And one more principle is important to Miller and his colleagues. It is the year-day principle. One day in prophecy equals one year in real time. And so that also becomes an important principle of interpretation for the historical emphases of the books of Daniel and Revelation. So when interpreting the seven trumpets, Miller and Millerite writers understood each of the trumpet to refer to a definite time period in history, parallel to some others, that would go from the time of Jesus all the way to the time of the end. And they applied the symbolism of the trumpets, particularly to the Ottoman Empire, uh, the Turkey of the time. And they, they, that's where they saw the fulfillment. And for example, you take Josiah Litch, one of the key uh, preachers and also supporters and colleagues of William Miller, came to the conclusion that, and that was one of the most famous moment in the Millerite movement, came to the conclusion that if you take together the five months, prophetic time here, of the fifth trumpet of Revelation 9, and you add that to the 391 years and 15 days of the sixth trumpet, an hour, a day, a month, and a year, also in Revelation chapter 9. If you add all of this together and you've got the right beginning point in time, you would come to the conclusion so that the end of the sixth trumpet would be the fall of the Ottoman Empire on August 11, 1840. So you take a clear year day principle and looking for exact fulfillment in history uh, for these details of prophecy. These precise mathematical calculations and their exact historical fulfillments encouraged Millerite preachers just to go ahead with a lot of conviction that Jesus is coming again sometimes in 1843, 1844. 
And such precise integration of biblical symbols and historical events really contributed a great deal to the missionary zeal of the Millerite movement. I mean, they had assurance that all of this would come to a conclusion in 1843-44, in October 22, 1844. The same zeal would carry over into the Sabbatarian Adventist movement of early Seventh-day Adventists with the same zeal in their interpretation of Daniel and Revelation. Soon after the Millerite disappointment of October 1844, which by the way is 175 years next week, Sabbatarian Adventists built on the same biblical, historical methodology of the Millerites and kept many of the same concepts, the same factors, the same conclusions in their interpretation. And so folks like Joseph Bates, James White, John Andrews were the leading interpreters and continued to use Miller's principles and method of historical interpretation of Daniel and Revelation. They are in direct line with Miller. In, in fact, would copy the same list of interpretations or rules interpretations, publicize them and use them. <clears throat> of all Seventh-day Adventist interpreters of the first two generations, of course, is Orion Smith and his book, Thoughts on Daniel and the Revelation, first published in 1862 and then a number of editions afterwards. In his commentary, Smith inter integrated really few strands of thoughts from Joseph Bates, Miller, and, and White, and John Andrews, and many others, and he offered uh, even some of his own interpretation, but overall, Arias Smith is following the same lead, the same conclusions as those of the Millerite movement. He's in direct link with Miller and the Millerite movement. In the first few decades of the 20th century, many Seventh-day Adventist interpreters followed carefully Arias Smith and William Miller's interpretation. Stephen Haskell and his two books, uh, the story of Daniel the prophet, and then the story of the seer of Patmos, both published in the first decade of the 20th century, uh, were very much in sync with what uh, Uriah Smith had published. You go a few years later, a couple decades later, you've got uh, William Spicer, a general conference president for a while, who with his beacon lights of prophecy is also consistently following Uriah Smith's there we go, Arias Smith's understanding of the historical interpretation of Daniel and Revelation. Students of Bible prophecy can still find fulfillment of the biblical symbols in historical facts, in the pages of history. Closer to our time, there's also Leroy Froome in the 1960s, 1950s and 60s, with his massive, voluminous, four-volume series, The Prophetic Faith of Our Fathers, where he showed uh, evidences that a historical biblical interpretation of Daniel and Revelation went all the way uh, throughout the centuries of Christian faith. But we get closer to us, and we've got C. Mervyn Maxwell, who essentially also reflected in his writings the same emphases of interpretation of Daniel and Revelation, as did Uriah Smith. He also searched for the realization of God's purpose of caring, that's his theme on God cares, caring for his people throughout history until the end of time. In his two-volume commentary, uh, Maxwell gave priority to the interpretation of biblical symbols through historical events and gave less attention to exegetical or theological interpretation in his books. In time, Maxwell's books really replaced Uriah Smith by being perhaps a little bit more relevant, less focused on Turkey, so to speak, with, uh, with the seven trumpets, but still, still within the same understanding, the same practice of looking in history for the fulfillment of biblical details. Quispy, in his book here in his dissertation, mentions five tendencies of this approach to Daniel and Revelation. Five tendencies that are clear in their uh, application of historical events to biblical symbols. The first one is that it is clear. That's what it is intending to do. Number two, God is in control of history from the perspective of the great controversy. 
That is a theme that comes through all of these books, all of these interpreters. God is in charge. And if you look at history carefully, if you find the fulfillment of these details, you will know that God is guiding history all along. So that's the second tendency of that mode of interpretation, of that emphasis. A third one is that there is no possibility for a second or a multiple fulfillment of prophecy. That's an important detail here. Uh, when you use the year-day principle, there is only one way that that interpretation is fulfilled, not two or three or four. There's one way to interpret the year-day principle. So all of these dates, all of these numbers have one interpretation, not two, not three. So that's also very crucial for Orion Smith and, and all of the others there, and Maxwell as well. A fourth tendency of this emphasis is a parallel recapitulation, so to speak, of the events of the time periods of the prophets from his time to the end of time. For example, in the book of Daniel, Daniel 2 is parallel to Daniel 7, or Daniel 7 is parallel to Daniel 2. Daniel 8 and 9 is a parallel of 7 and 2, and Daniel 10 to 12 is also the same period of time, or the same periods of time, as Daniel 8, 9, 7, and 2. Same thing with the book of Revelation. The seven churches, the seven seals, the seven trumpets, and so on, are covering the same periods of times. That's a recapitulation of the periods of times. That's an important tendency, uh, emphasis of a uh, principle of interpretation of that understanding of the prophecies of Daniel and Revelation. A fifth one, naturally, obviously, that was with William Miller and any early Adventist pioneer, a strong sense of urgency that the end of the world is coming soon. That is a, a, that is a logical conclusion of this emphasis of interpretation. When you look at the timetables, when you look at the date lines, when you do your charts, when you find the fulfillment of all these details of prophecy in history, well, of course, Jesus is coming soon. Duh. It's obvious. So that, so missionary zeal comes out of this emphasis, and it, it's a very strong uh, part of that understanding of the books of Daniel and Revelation. Yet, not all is well with this emphasis. As much as it is part of our DNA, this emphasis more than the other two is really part of our DNA. As much as it is part of our DNA, it is not all good and not all well with this emphasis. Let me give you an example of that. And I found it myself when I read uh, C. Mervyn Maxwell's books on Daniel and Revelation. See, Maxwell had been one of my teachers at seminary, and his books were coming out as I was doing seminary. And so although Maxwell followed closely the same methodology as Miller, Orion Smith, and all the others, when it came to his interpretation of the seven trumpets of Revelation, he did not espouse in his book the same conclusion that Josiah Litch had come to in his calculations of the time periods in the seven trumpets, trumpet number five, trumpet number six. Maxwell does not talk about August 11, 1840 in his book on Revelation. He does not, and why not? He is silent about this date that Josiah Litch and the Millerite movement found so crucial to understanding their way of understanding prophecies in Daniel and Revelation. Well, perhaps, you know, I never asked him before he died, and I wish I had. But by the time I arrived here at the seminary, he had retired. I had less contact, opportunities for contacts with him. And then, you know, within a couple of years, he died, uh, leukemia. And uh, I, I, I could never ask him. But perhaps as a well-trained historian, Maxwell knew that there was little, if nothing, of historical significance that happened on August 11, 1840. And maybe that's why he didn't include it in his book. I, I don't know. I'm still puzzled. And you know, with the passing of years and decades, and now two centuries, the historical evidence used in the past by Uriah Smith, for example, is no longer that convincing to a lot of modern Adventists. <laughs> 
And so no one set about to disprove, to invalidate, to tarnish this methodology of Arya Smith. Time did it. And perhaps that's why the other two methodologies come along, to try to rescue historicism because of some of the issues that some historians and biblical scholars are finding with Uriah Smith's understanding of the prophecies of Daniel and Revelation. And so we get to the second emphasis that Gluder Quispy discusses in his book. In order to rescue historicism as a methodology of interpretation, Adventist scholars have emphasized two other ways of looking at Daniel and Revelation. And the first and dominant one still today among scholars is now the exegetical emphases that analyzes the biblical text in Hebrew, Aramaic, that's for Daniel, and in Greek for the book of Revelation, uses literary analysis of the biblical text, often it's in original languages, to try to understand the prophetic symbols and to apply them to historical events. That's what this methodology is trying to do. And the first example of that, in, in a nutshell, or at least in, in an embryo perspective, it begins to be used, is in the Seventh-day Adventist Bible commentary that comes out in the 1950s. For the first time, really, exegesis of the Greek and the Hebrew of Daniel and Revelation is being used to help the interpretation of, of uh, Daniel and Revelation. So it built on that. And building on what the Bible commentary did, then a number of Adventist scholars continued that mode of thinking of looking at Daniel and Revelation. One was Kenneth Strand, a professor also here at the seminary in the 1970s, 80s, and the 90s. He died also in the 1990s. Um, Kenneth Strand played an important role in the study of the book of Revelation in 1972, when he published a tiny little book uh, on the literary and chiastic structure of the book of Revelation. Never seen before, never done before, and the entire world of Revelation studies by Adventists and non-Adventists began to see something in the book of Revelation that this Adventist scholar had found. But he found that by looking at the literary structure of the book of Revelation not looking at history, looking at the literary structure, how the book is written. And you've got different scenes of, of the sanctuary that are introducing different parts of the book of Revelation. You know, he goes into all of this tiny little book that changed the entire world of study, I think, from my perspective here. Again, I'm not a specialist. I'm looking at it from a historical perspective. And so, less than a decade later, following the difficult controversy with Desmond Ford and his reinterpretation of apocalyptic books, Daniel and Revelation, the General Conference set up a committee to study Daniel and Revelation and to offer to the church some guidelines in their interpretation. And that committee came to be known as DARCOM, Daniel and Revelation Committee, DARCOM. And they published many, many books on how to study Daniel and Revelation, seven books altogether, uh, and the primary methodology used in this book is exegesis, looking at the Greek and the Hebrew and, and delving into the literary structures of those books to try to understand what those books are saying. Anyone who has studied these seven books, and I've got a lot of them in my library, not all of them, but quite a few of them, realizes that the subject of this exegetical study of Daniel and Revelation has become complicated. No other word. It's complicated even for somebody like me who knows some Greek and some Hebrew and, you know, and all of this. It's complicated. It's a discipline for the elect and the initiated. On the basis of the literary analysis of Daniel and Revelation, along with an excellent mastery of the original languages, one should be able to see that these two books have different historical periods, and some events were fulfilled in the time of the prophets, or shortly thereafter. Some events are fulfilled over centuries, and then some events are to be fulfilled still in the future. Some writers of this emphasis there mix together all these concepts of preterism, historicism, futurism, and not realizing, I think, 
that true historicism has a mix of all of them together. In any case, one needs to keep in mind at the same time that these scholars also tried to explain the historicist methodology to non-Adventist scholars. That's crucial here. Many of these scholars, and I'll, I'll show a few of them here in a moment, really did their best to present to non-Adventist scholars of Daniel and Revelation a point of view on Daniel and Revelation that they had not seen before. And to do this, you've got to do it in the language that they understand. And so that's Greek and Hebrew and analysis and this and that, and, it, and it's complicated. But their efforts paid off. They succeeded today in our at, in our non-Adventist Society of Biblical Literature, Academy of Religion, uh, a lot of our own scholars, Roy is one of them, Martin, and, and uh, uh, also there, everybody is able you know, to present some of these papers. They're being listened to because they've been using exegesis to be able to get at that. So uh, we're, we're, we're glad for that. So on the basis of this, they've been able to use this methodology, and it is perhaps now another favorite methodology. So who are they? Well, of course, it's Ranko Stefanovic right here at the seminary on the book of Revelation. He's certainly using this methodology in his interpretation of the book of Revelation. His brother, Zdravko, has done the same thing with the book of Daniel. And then, of course, I'm forgetting some others, John Pauline, uh, Roy Gain, and uh, Jacques Ducan. I've done the same thing with the books of Daniel and Revelation. Uh, they're not alone. Many, many colleagues that we have in Adventist universities are also following this methodology. Many of them were trained here at the seminary and are using this methodology now to help their students. And so it is a large group now of Adventist scholars who are preferring this methodology to understand Daniel and Revelation. And I would probably guess, I've not attended your lectures last year nor so far this year, that a lot of you are arguing over the meaning of these words. And you're using Hebrew or Aramaic. I'm not too sure what Daniel 11 is written on in. Hebrew or Aramaic? It's in Hebrew. So you're using Hebrew to try to understand what these terms are meaning and what they correspond to. So this emphasis also has some clear tendencies, four of them here that Quispy mentions in his book, four tendencies of this approach to looking at Daniel and Revelation. Of course, first of all, it's a focus on the original text. It's a focus on, on the original author, the original audience, perhaps to some extent, to a neglect of the future. But be that as it may, it's the original text. That's usually what is the intent of this methodology. Not so much looking at history books as much as it is looking at the biblical books. There's a careful comparison that is done in this methodology uh, with other books of the Bible. So when you find a word in Hebrew or in Greek, you want to find its meaning in some other books of the Bible and to find allusions, perhaps the root sources of some of the imagery that is being used. John Pauline is very good at that in his commentaries on the book of Revelation. And so you look, you do an intertextuality, so to speak. You go from place, place to place and you compare those words and those words together will probably give you a meaning of what this is all about. Now, you'll realize here that William Miller, Uriah Smith, who had no knowledge of Greek and Hebrew, were not able to do that. But people who have the original languages are able to do this now. So that's part of that methodology. Another tendency, number three, is to study the literary structure of these books and to find chiasms, if possible, or any literary styles or structures that may be helpful in the interpretation of the books. I tell you, if you find a chiasm, oh, I know that's very technical. It's a very technical exegetical term. It refers to a Greek letter that looks like an X. And uh, sometimes uh, writers of the Old Testament and the New Testament use that as a literary structure of how to write a particular passage. And if you, you find a passage that looks something like that, uh, I tell you, you you've discovered a, a gold mine of interpretation there. And so that's helpful for these scholars. But again, you, you've got to dig deep here to find this. Number four, 
There's a diversity of approaches that is used by many of them. It goes back and forth. Not all of them are using it at the same level or to the same extent, but sometimes they use preterism. What did the author mean in his own day and what did people understand in his own day? Uh, historicism, what does it mean throughout history? And futurism, what, what are some of these things that are still to be fulfilled in the future and we don't quite know? And so all of these approaches are kind of intermingled together in the interpretations of Daniel and Revelation. And of course, please note that not all of them are doing it with the same conviction and with the same extent. There's a lot of diversity there. But in general, these are four tendencies of that second methodology. They all want to find historical fulfillment of these prophecies. But to get at that is not first by looking at a history book. It is first by looking at what the text says and the words being used, the literary structures and what that is trying to say. And from there, you're trying to find the fulfillment. According to Quispy, the exegetical emphasis places more weight on literary analysis and the historical context of the time of the books of Daniel and Revelation. Thus, the main tendency of this approach is to focus on what the text meant for the primary readers, which can be derived from a careful analysis of the original languages and through exploring all kinds of things, the linguistic, literary, historical, geographical, religious, philosophical, and cultural contexts of these books and when they were written. This emphasis also tends to be more cautious when attempting to apply a precise historical event to an exact fulfillment of the ap apocalyptic symbol. You know, there's going to be a little bit of hesitation there. Is, is, is this really how this symbol is being fulfilled? Perhaps one of the greatest side effects of this emphasis has been to remove it, to remove the study of Daniel and Revelation from the hands of self-taught people like Miller and Smith and Litch, and to place it in the hands of well-educated scholars. While the biblical historical emphases of earlier generations applied simple rules of interpretation that anybody could understand to the biblical symbols and sought to find their historical fulfillment as best they could, this exegetical emphasis requires excellent knowledge of the original languages and skills also in literary analysis. Not anybody can do this. It's the domain of experts now. And they spar with each other over the precise parsing of these words and metaphors and the correct application of rules of grammar and syntax. Inasmuch as historicism through the centuries has been the science of self-taught people and has captured the imagination of generations of people looking for you know, the end of the world, the exegetical emphasis really has become a science for the well-trained scholars. Few people can really engage in that methodology. I hope I'm not being too strong here. I know I've got some very good colleagues in the room. Um, I'm being as gentle as I can, but anyway, your questions and answers will come later. Okay, third emphasis. Third emphasis. This one has to do with the theological meaning of the books of Daniel and Revelation, trying to understand the overarching meaning of the prophecies within a cosmic conflict perspective or great controversy perspective. That becomes theological here. That's the third emphasis. And so that emphasis, therefore, came to view, really, um, according to Quispy, with a man by the name of Louis Veer. Veer or Weir, I, I think his name should be pronounced Veer, I'm not sure. But a number of books that he published uh, in the 1930s, 1940s, he is an Australian. And uh, in a number of his books, he uses a different interpretation of Daniel and Revelation. And his interpretation is a fascinating one. Of course, with the passing of time, Uriah Smith's interpretation of these chapters opened the door for trying to find some different insights. Uh, what is this all meaning? According to Quispy, this pastor in Australia uh, 
when he began to give his twist on the interpretation of Daniel and Revelation, particularly his twist on Daniel 11 and on the Battle of Armageddon. Uh, he taught a non-military, non-Palestinian view of Armageddon and, and Daniel 11, and argued for a Christocentric typological application of end-time prophecies. Lots of people disagreed with him because he was too close in time to Uriah Smith, to the point of suspending his denominational employment in 1943. That did not prevent him, however, from writing his views and continuing to exert a long-term influence on many Adventist pastors, not only in Australia, but in North America and in Europe. So what is this all about? What did he want to say? Well, here are some key principles of Louis Veer and his approach, his theological approach to Daniel and Revelation. Quispy notes that perhaps the single most basic principle of interpretation of prophecy to Veer is the interpretation must reveal Christ and make him the center. However you want to interpret any of these Bible prophecies, it must talk about God if it is Daniel, it must talk about Jesus if it is the book of Revelation. And it must fo be focused on what God is doing or what Jesus is doing. That's his first key rule of interpretation when he came to Daniel in Revelation. Christ is to be the focal point of any interpretation, not Turkey and not the papacy. That's perhaps why he got so much into trouble during Second World War, 1940s, 1930s, when he moved away from Uriah Smith so strongly here in his interpretation. Other principles of interpretation in Veer's list include the spiritual and typological interpretation of all, please underline that, the word all, of all Bible names and geographical locations in biblical prophecies. So if you've got the word Armageddon, it is therefore not a literal place, although in ancient history there is a place called the mountain of Megiddo. Yes, there is a valley of Megiddo in all of this, in the books of Kings and, and so on, Samuel. But when it comes to a Bible prophecy, immediately that word must be interpreted typologically and symbolically. It cannot be literal. So don't look to interpret the prophecies looking at all these words and trying to find where in history or where in geography this particular event is going to take place. It is spiritual and it is typological. It is not a literal geographical place. And his attempt at understanding any Old Testament references in New Testament prophecies would first have had a literal fulfillment in the Old Testament time, but then when you transpose that into New Testament time, immediately, once you pass the cross in any time period, once you pass the cross, any of these events is going to have a spiritual theological fulfillment at the time of the end. Don't look at it literally. That is a basic principle of interpretation of Lewis Veer. And so, let's take, for example, Daniel 11. The magic is not working anymore, Todd. Am I pushing the laser? I am. There we go. I'm sorry. <laughs> For example, when you get to Daniel 11, verse 45, the king of the north refers to the combined forces of the Babylonian church, i.e. the papacy, dominating the state. So don't look at it to be some kind of Middle Eastern Palestinian uh, political figure. It cannot be. It has to delve into the world of spiritual uh, reality or the church and so on. And so the king of the north cannot be, uh, you know, a, as I've said, a Palestinian something. He understood the king of the north to be the papacy. He used extensive comparisons with other Old Testament texts and Ellen White's writings to conclude that the king of the north refers to the combined forces of the Babylonian church dominating the state. He continues, in Daniel 11:44 and 45, depicts 
the united efforts of the world powers led by the King of the North to enter the citadel, the holy mountain, to destroy the people of God. And what is the citadel, the holy mountain? Well, for him, because of all his intense comparison of the Old Testament and the writings of Ellen White, he comes to the conclusion that the glorious land, the holy mountain, is none other than the church, the true faithful people of God. It is not a literal geographical location. We continue another example here, again taken from one of his books, which, by the way, I have right here. This, these are the two books that La Rondelle said we should read when I took his class on eschatology, two books by Louis Veer that he, he had reprinted. So here it is. Here is a, a statement summarizing Louis Veer's interpretation of the last events of Daniel 11. It is when the state enters the domain of conscience. So you see the glorious land here is spiritualized to become human conscience of, of God's people. Uh, the glorious land of Daniel 11:41. In oppressive enact enactments are uh, commencing to bring hardship, derision, and the threat of imprisonment that the majority forsake us. Then the prophecy of Daniel 11:41 will meet its fulfillment. It is when the deadly wound is healed. Now you note here that he is combining this with Revelation 11. He sees Revelation, uh, sorry, Revelation 13. He sees Revelation 13 and the healing of the wound of Daniel 7, the little horn, and what happens at Daniel 11 at the very end. He sees that's all together. That's all the same thing. It's all referring to all the same events. And so he says, uh, it is when the deadly wound is healed, when the church and state combine to enforce religious dogmas, that all the world wanders after the beast in Revelation 13. It is then that the king of the north enters into the glorious land, the domain of conscience, the territory of the church. You see, everything is spiritualized here. Nothing is literal in any of these interpretations. So Veer's typological interpretation of Bible prophecies resulted in a grand synthesis and harmonization. I tell you, he does that perhaps best than anybody else. He harmonizes everything that has anything to do with eschatology of end time prophecies in Daniel Revelation, along with any of the prophecies of Isaiah, Joel, Ezekiel, and Ellen White's writings. He puts them all together, weaves them all together to give an interpretation of Daniel 11. I don't think anyone has done such a synthesis since him. Yet, I should admit that I find at times that his synthesis is forced. I mean, I've read the books, and in preparation for this uh, event, I reread this one, especially on Daniel 11 and the King of the North. I find sometimes it is forced. He's jumping, he's stretching some arguments, because it must fit some predetermined conclusions, I think, that he has. Be that as it may. Veer's influence gained a lot of respect in the 1940s and 1950s as more and more Adventist interpreters began to use this Christ-centered theological and typological interpretation of Daniel and Revelation, but particularly of Revelation. Have you noted that the Bible seminar you had here a couple of weeks ago, your title was Jesus... On, of prophecy? Yeah? Jesus of prophecy or in prophecy? There you go. That's Veer's influence. Uh, uh, Ranko Stefanovic's book on commentary on the book of Revelation, you, you know the title by heart? The Revelation of Jesus Christ. That's the influence here. Things are seen through who Jesus is. And that is still today Veer's influence, I think, into our interpretation of Daniel and Revelation. But no author, apart from Hans La Rondelle, in the 1980s and 1990s, right here at Andrews University, had an influence following and promoting Veer's theological emphases as he did. I remember very well when I was an MDiv student here at the seminary in the 1980s. I took a few courses from La Rondelle. And he openly admitted that the writings of Louis Veer and his methodology were what he had accepted and was using in his interpretation of eschatology of end time events, a Christocentric typological interpretation of Daniel and Revelation. 
to see the fulfillment of God's promises of Israel to the church. La Rondelle has had a long-lasting influence on all Adventist authors of commentaries on Daniel and Revelation, including those who are using the exegesis emphases. Somehow, all of them want to talk about God if it is about Daniel and want to talk about Jesus if it is the book of Revelation. See, that, that's, where it's, that's where it's at. I think there's, of course, there's a cross-fertilization here of all three. You can't separate them. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to separate them, but honestly, can you really separate them? Not really. So like the other two emphases, the theological one has some tendencies, and here are four of them. First of all, there's the focus of the interpretational perspective of the book of Revelation on Jesus and the gospel. Mentioned that already, I can move on. Number two, there is some hesitancy to identify specific dates and specific places as the fulfillment of prophecy. Why is that? Because people are afraid of misinterpretation. The book of Uriah Smith is a long time ago, and people don't want to repeat Uriah Smith's mistakes as time goes by. But there is also the natural tendency that everything is typological. Everything is spiritualized. There is no real physical interpretation of any of these events. It's more of a spiritual nature, more of a theological nature, as to do with the great controversy. There's, there's a hesitation there to pinpoint exactly what, when is the fulfillment of this or that. It views the biblical historical emphasis, that's Uriah Smith, as losing the richness of the biblical message. Now there's a little bit of negativity here. That methodology will kind of poo-poo or just push aside Uriah Smith and his approach. He says that's too infantile, it's too baby, and it, 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 it's, you're, you're not getting the substance of what Daniel and Revelation is really about. So that tends to happen there. Again, be cautious there. I'm just generalizing things. Number four, there is an intentional emphasis on the spiritual and the theological meaning of the symbols of Daniel and Revelation. That is a, a true uh, intentional. That's really the big purpose of what this emphasis is about. So how do I conclude these three emphases? So what do we learn? Well, according to Quispy, each one of these emphasis is using a historicist method of interpretation for the books of Daniel and Revelation. But as you can tell, the conclusions will vary, particularly regarding dates and precise historical fulfillment. And over the last 175 years of Adventist publications on Daniel and Revelation, each of these three emphases has shown different you know, tendencies. Each emphasis has its strength it is perhaps good to listen to what each has to say. And as I've said, you know, some of them are cross-fertilizing one another, overlapping. You can't really separate them or pigeonhole, you know, authors into this one or that one. And maybe using all of them together might be more helpful. And today, most Adventist expositors, I would say, are combining all three to some extent, although they may be more in one camp or the other. Certainly, I would say that Hans LaRondel is a theological, typological, and I would think that my colleagues that are exegesis are primarily exegesis, but then using the other two uh, on the side. The biblical historical emphasis focuses on the historical application of prophecies, claims to be faithful to the methods used by the Millerite preachers and early Seventh-day Adventist pioneers that used this interpretation and saw themselves as being the fulfillment of prophecy. The discussions of a federal Sunday law in the late 1880s, the events surrounding the two world wars tended to reinforce the belief in that emphasis of Orion Smith and, of course, Ellen White's writings are obviously, I believe, supporting this emphasis. The exegetical emphasis has a natural tendency of studying carefully the original context and documents of, of the books of Daniel and Revelation. It seeks for clues of interpretation by carefully analyzing the text and the literary structures. For its part, the theological emphasis, the third one, looks at the bigger picture of Daniel and Revelation rather than specific details. 
This emphasis tends to be Christ-centered with a focus on the great controversy theme and cosmic conflict between good and evil. There is a natural tendency with a the theological emphasis to spiritualize things and to seek to find the spiritual, the moral lessons that, that they offer to people who suffer similar situations as the people in the time of Daniel and Revelation did. So from my perspective, I see that the passing of time, now 175 years since the Millerite movement of the 1840s, is perhaps the biggest historical conundrum that Adventist prophetic interpretation faces. It's unavoidable that Adventist prophetic interpretation is impacted by this. And you've got people that are wrestling, trying to, to make sense of, of these two books and trying to understand them, given you know, the time that has, lasted, that has lapsed for so long. While some interpreters feel buoyed up by this and claim to even be more persuaded by their historical interpretation, some others you know, are much more hesitant and somewhat skeptical sometimes. While I'm not sure where things will go from here, I think the exegetical and theological emphases, the last two I mentioned, will continue to be favored in Adventist circles. While I think the exegesis emphases is the domain of scholars, less access accessible to lay people in the pew, the theological perspective is one that I find perhaps more helpful to lay people and to Adventist pastors and pastors perhaps are more and more turning to it, at least my sense of that, that I see in conversations. The theme of the cosmic conflict of a Christ-centered interpretation of Daniel and Revelation are far more, more, far more rewarding and spiritually nourishing than attention perhaps to some little details that are ever-changing. The distance of many decades from our pioneers has made people step back and take a more careful look as to how we look at these two books. A theological interpretation of Daniel and Revelation seems more conducive to spiritual nurture and growth rather than scaring people perhaps with some details. One last thing that I want to say, um, and I don't know where this is going to go. We'll have to see how, as to how time goes. But in a two weeks, in two weeks, Baker Publishing in Grand Rapids is going to release a Bible commentary on the book of Revelation written by an Adventist scholar, Sigvid Tonstad, a professor at Loma Linda University. I, I, I'm pretty sure where he's going in this commentary because of some discussions I've had with him and reading some of his uh, blogs on Spectrum, uh, but he is using the theological, typological interpretation of the book of Revelation like no one has done before. Uh, I'm not doing Star Trek here, but I think he's going into a, a field that very few have done before, and uh, we'll see where that goes and how it is received. Perhaps of all the interpreters of the book of Revelation, he is one that is departing the most from Arias Smith and really going even further than Louis Veer and Hans La Rondelle. I haven't read the commentary. It's coming out, as I've said, in a couple of weeks. Time will tell as to how his approach to Daniel and Revelation will be received. I hope this has been helpful, not too complicated and not too much there, uh, but at least I hope it was a good historical survey of three tendencies that we have had within us. And of course, you could miss, mix all of them together and perhaps create uh, three more embassies. But um, thank you for your time. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Fortin. Uh, that was a very uh, uh, a sweeping overview of uh, a lot of complex topics. And uh, so we have some questions or comments from the floor here. Yeah, yes, uh, say your name again, your brother Hugo, I know that, yes. Yes, brother Hugo from yes. California. I would like to ask the professor, uh, what method did our pioneers use in the early years of our movement where they described praying over a text and then the Holy Spirit would give them the answer? What method were they using in those early days when they would study all night long, come to an impasse, pray, and God would reveal something to Ellen White. What, what method was that? 
It's an experiential method, isn't it? It's a spiritual experience. I mean, they're praying to God for God's guidance, and I think everybody does here. Any of these authors I have mentioned, you know, really do that. But here you're referring to a specific occasion and specific timeline in Adventist history, the late 1840s, uh, when that happened. And these people were doing a couple methodologies. They were doing, you know, following the methods they had inherited from William Miller and that basic perspective that they had used themselves uh, in the Millerite movement in the early years of the Sabbatarian movement, but they were also using an exegesis method of the English Bible, the King James Version Bible. That's what they were using. So they were comparing text with text, uh, and Miller had taught that as well and not so much on history, perhaps more comparing scripture with scripture. That is exegesis, for sure it is. When you compare scripture with scripture, you're doing an exegesis, but you're not doing it, you know, with the Greek and the Hebrew, and they didn't have it. These folks did not know Greek and Hebrew, but they were still using that methodology. They were combining things really together. Okay, thank you. Uh, yes, uh, Brother Brendan? I'm just curious, uh where you think, because I know he, his common, like his uh, thesis was on uh, Revelation, but um, yes. Des Ford wrote a, a commentary on Daniel. He did. What would you think would, he would be identified? Which of the three categories? Now, da uh, Desmond, Ford, Desmond Ford's uh, commentary on Daniel, by the way, was one of my textbooks at the seminary. When I took the class on Daniel, it was, you know, a book he had written before all the controversy had happened. That book is an exegetical study of the book of Daniel. I think Daniel's commentary or Ford's commentary on Daniel is really an exegesis. I mean, he's in line with many of our other colleagues. And I guess coming to some different conclusions, perhaps, yeah. but he's still using exegesis, the Hebrew and the Aramaic. And, and Cottrell as well, who kind of departed in later years, he was working on the Bible commentary. So he's another one who came through the exegetical. I think so. Cottrell, as one of the editors of the Bible commentary, yes, I think he would have been in that mindset as well. Mm. Yes. All right, uh, Dr. Gain. All right, here's a, one of our exegesis professors. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Fortana, that was very enlightening. Thank you. Um, I learned a lot and the way you laid out the emphases in the different views, um, I couldn't help but thinking there's just so much truth in each one of them. And um, my, my question for you is how each, uh, how the second and third were reactions against the previous ones, um, how they developed historically. It seems to me, uh, my, my personal approach is to begin with the exegesis and to um, work out what the profiles of the text are and then try to look at reliable historical interpretation to see how that fits. So that's where the history fits. And then... You see, you're combining them together. Exactly. exactly. And then from that, then the synthesis of looking at all the details, we should arrive at the theological message, which is all about Christ. So I think it shouldn't be an either or. It should be all three together in that order, exegetical, uh, combined with historical and then theological. But for some reason in the Adventist church, there's been a, a progression <clears throat> of emphases that I guess 1918, the fall of the Ottoman Empire was a big deal for moving from the, the literal historical saying that doesn't quite work because Turkey isn't mm. in the picture anymore and so on. But could you just elucidate a little bit how each one reacted to the previous and that helped to spur the different emphasis? I, I, I think, I think the exegetical emphasis and the theological emphasis both reacted to Uriah Smith and to the fact that his historical interpretation of some of the details of the trumpets and of Daniel, you know, were because time went by and the events didn't happen, people began to be disillusioned with only using a historical interpretation of, this, of these symbols. And it tended to be also a Eurocentric interpretation of these symbols. And, and because time goes by and World War I goes by, uh, Turkey is no longer, or the Ottoman Empire no longer exists. I think the exegesis method and the theological method were trying to find a better answer to Daniel and Revelation. I don't know that the theological emphases and the exegetical emphases are in competition with each other or competing with each other or addressing each other. 
I think they're building on each other. I, I, I don't think these two methodologies are in conflict. I think they're both responding to Uriah Smith. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um... Because most of the authors, as you've said, uh, whether it's Ranko, uh, Sigvi Tonstad, or John Pauline, use, use both exegesis and theology. Cosmic conflict, big picture. Both are being used in these comments. Jacques Ducan certainly does that well too in his books that I've read. Okay, thank you, Brother Greg Bratcher. Uh, just a comment. Uh, you know, I appreciate you focusing, for instance, on the positives of Lewis Ware that we, we're left with. Jesus is the focus of prophecy, though we may not agree with every detail that Lewis Ware wrote. Yeah, you're right. And I think that's important as we do these debates together, that we may not agree on every detail together, but, but there's good yeah. that comes even through the mistakes. Yeah. And that, we, that, that tends to last, you know, it, we tend to hold on to. And so God, and these subjects are so big that, you know, as you, just, you have one person describing all of this history, I'm listening, and I've, I've read just about all these guys you've mentioned. You see Mervyn Maxwell, et cetera, et cetera, and I like parts of his, and I discard other parts, and, <laughs> you know. So a lot of us have seen these, this trend, and it was helpful for you to, to kind of articulate that. For, uh, but I like the, let's, you know, even though we may not agree with everything Ware wrote, because it was written a long time ago, yes. let's not disregard the positives that can come. That's right. Okay, and, thank you. I have a question from the front and I think, here. And I think you're validating, you know, the cross fertilization of these methodologies. That's, that's what's happening. Yeah. Okay. Well, the, this was most excellent because this helped, this helped frame a lot of history. And one of the things that comes through to me is not only what you brought up, but another element of this is the publishing houses or who was doing the publishing. So for example, I, I go back now, um, I, I was a student here under both Maxwell and John Pauline, and when Maxwell came out with his, his revelation, he did not take a position on Christ being the rider on the white horse and the seals. Okay. His three words in that book are, in any case. So he, he gives you reason to think it could be Jesus, but he doesn't go that far. And earlier when you spoke about we're, maybe writing his material too soon after Uriah Smith. Well, we see the same thing that happened with Maxwell. He did not come out and say, this is Jesus Christ, as even our Dutch Reform and Presbyterians had. And at this time, we also had the dispensationalists coming in saying, oh, this is the Antichrist. So that was coming up. He doesn't make the statement, but yet we had many Adventists who were buying this book. This is a book that also went out through our literature evangelist. Mm -hmm. And so nobody had a position of Christ being the writer. Not until Pauline and Mark Finley came out with their publications where they straight on said, this is Jesus Christ. I think once Finley said that and it went published, now everybody felt comfortable saying, this is Christ. So you can see you go from not talking about who the writer is to playing around with who the writer might be to finally saying, we think it's okay to say this is Jesus Christ. But I, I, I mentioned the publishers because again, I, I never went back to Maxwell either. I always wondered after his death, was that his position or was it the publisher saying, let's not go too far here on this. Mm -hmm. The same thing <laughs> happens. Well, I mean, it, it happens, right? The same thing happened with DARCOM. There were five of us who sat in on uh, John Pauline's dissertation, and he was so disappointed after he presented his papers to DARCOM because, again, here's kind of the battle between the first and the second interpretations. His paper wasn't accepted by DARCOM because there was some things in his trumpet um, analysis that did not square with a statement or two from Alan White. Mm. And so consequently, his paper was not accepted uh, in terms of the books that you were showing earlier. Well, uh, well, you know, I, I guess it was, it was more just the enlightenment, and I'll, I'll close with this. When you come to the last with the theological meaning, I think Russell Burrell, when he wrote his book, The New World Order, 
that was a surprise to a lot of Adventists who are used to the older historical application hmm. because now he comes out and in a simple way is taking a lot of the newer thinking and putting it out to people. So just in terms of publishing, your, your presentation was so great because it was able to allow me to begin to see where all these pieces go and what's happened over history. Yeah. So I appreciate it. I do know for a fact that Sig Vitonstad's book uh, on Revelation does not follow the standard interpretation of the six seals and that white horse and all of that. You'll be surprised when you read that. Okay, thank you. Um, we have a brother back. Can you give us your name, brother? Sure. Paul Lawrence. Okay, thank you. Um, in light of um, Quispy's rules of interpretation, you mentioned that um, the biblical names and geographical locations um, and prophecies are supposed to be symbolic and not literal. Was he referring to the, like just some of the chapters of Daniel, the whole book of Daniel and Revelation, or just, just some chapters of Daniel? That is too an intricate of a question for me to be able to answer. I have not read everything of Louis Veer, so I, I cannot say, but I do know from what I've read in, for Daniel 11 that once a timeline of prophecy passes the cross, after the cross, everything is spiritual and typological. So if an event in Daniel 11, according to a timeline of what Daniel 11 is all about, uh, it, once you pass, in, pass the cross, so Daniel 11, uh, verses 41 to 45, that is all spiritual, none of it is geographically literal. Um, I, my question pertains to, there was a slide you had the four tendencies of exegetical emphasis, and maybe, um, maybe I need an update on what these terms are referring to. Um, but the last point you, it, it was on the slide says, diversity of approaches such as preterism, futurism, historicism, and idealism all have some validity for the interpretation of these books. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know if these books is, is just Daniel and Revelation, or we're talking about the whole prophetic corpus, but certainly there's part portions of Daniel and Revelation that have been fulfilled in the past. Yes. Certainly we have a place where we are now, and certainly there remains portions in the future. Yes. Um, and I don't know if that's the, you know, that's not necessarily how I've understood a preterist reading of the text or a futurist reading of the text or an idealistic right. reading of the text. So if you could give me some clarity on that. Thank you. Good question. Very, very good question. I kind of knew that this might be a little complicated. But again, not all scholars who are using primarily the exegetical methodology will use these terms similarly but I've heard it once in a while. So some of them are using these words that way. When they're talking to scholars that are non-Adventist non scholars and trying to make sense with them, and they're talking about the seven letters of Revelation, well, some of our scholars believe that the seven letters have nothing to do with historical fulfillment of prophecy seven time periods. Some of our interpreters say the seven letters were literally seven letters addressed to literally seven geographical locations of the time of John, so Tyathara, Pergamum, and so on. And these letters are true letters to be read and understood in the time period that John wrote that book. Therefore, that is a preterist understanding. That, that word is going to be used to, to refer to that interpretation. Now some people will then, maybe the same scholar will say, but when it comes to the interpretation of Revelation 12, to 13, 12 13, and 14, uh, there seems to be here a, a very strong allusion to a time period being fulfilled over centuries, o o o over a, a long period of time. A and so the word historicist there will be used to describe what Revelations 12 to 14 is about. And then, Okay, of course, if you go further into the future, Revelation 17 and on, and then that all seems to be in the future, and sometimes, while well, speaking to non-Adventist scholar, they will refer to their interpretation of those chapters as being futurist. So that, that's how it's used. 
a little problematic and a little misleading. But that's the way those words are used. Uh, yes, uh, we have a couple more questions. Uh, Brother Hick, give us your name and give us your question. Jerome. Yes, Jerome Skinner. Um, several of my students are here because I made it mandatory for uh, them that's to attend. Why. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's good for them to get a, another view that I didn't cover in class. My question was, when we see these varied emphases put forth, how has that affected Adventist mission historically? I'm not sure that I really can answer that. I, I mean, there's no doubt, uh, as far as I'm concerned, there's no doubt that the first, first view, the, the historical view, that's Uriah Smith, Siva Mervyn Maxwell, and any of them here, uh, huge zeal for missionary activity because uh, people have, uh, have, have got a, an exact timeline of exactly when Jesus is coming again, and, and it's two months from now. And so, it, it is because that interpretation is conducive to leading to that, to that conclusion. I'm not too sure where to place the exegetical emphasis when it comes to that question. When it comes to the theological emphases, there perhaps the emphasis on mission is going to be, look folks, you folks, Christians that are in the Soviet Union, that are in China, that are in Muslim countries. The book of Revelation is speaking to you of how to have faith in Jesus, regardless of persecutions, regardless of the circumstances against you, regardless of whatever state, beast may be against your faith. Know that the book of Revelation is for you right now. Don't look at a solution in the future. The solution, you have it right now. Jesus is in heaven. Jesus has opened the sealed book, and Jesus is getting ready to come again. Hold on to your faith in Jesus. God is in control of the events. So instead of being perhaps a, an, an emphasis on um, Jesus is coming around the corner in, in a couple months, now with the theological emphasis the emphasis tends to be in the preaching, in evangelism, is that that book is relevant for you right now where you are. Don't look for the future application of it. Look for it now in your life. That tends to be perhaps one way it's used, which is a beautiful way, complementary perhaps to the other one. And it, it's, it's quite relevant to people who are in situations of persecution. We don't feel that here in America. But there are plenty of our brothers and sisters and Christians of other denominations who are really having a hard time in some other countries. And the book of Revelation speaks hope to them when it's presented from a big cosmic conflict perspective and the big picture perspective. Uh, yes, and I'd just like to add a comment that um, I work with Adventist Frontier Missions. We work with many Muslims around the world. Uh, oftentimes, Adventist evangelists today in 2019 will start out a discussion of Islam and prophecy, and they'll talk about the fifth and sixth trumpets. It doesn't put Muslims off. It doesn't criticize Islam, but it says that God recognized the rise of Islam as a major world force. That is often used as an entering conversation point for discussion pro discussing prophecy with Muslims. Uh, in our experience in AFM, many, when the Muslims had a dream of Jesus, they want to go looking and discovering who Jesus is. Mm -hmm. And seeing the revelation of Jesus Christ from his speaking to John to his second coming in the book of Revelation is a powerful book to use with a Muslim who's searching for Jesus Christ. That's more of a theological emphasis. Um, but uh, in my experience, I've, I've studied with Muslims, I've baptized them, uh, going through these prophecies and showing not just Daniel 2, but I would still hold to the, the trumpets, the traditional understanding of the trumpets and the seven churches. This is a powerful argument for a Muslim that this book really is inspired. God is in control of history and Jesus is the one coming again. So from, a work, from an Adventist perspective, it's helpful, but for Muslims who are seeking to know about Jesus, the, the, the more his, uh, historical understanding yep. is a very powerful approach to use. Um, we have time for a couple more questions, yeah? Well, let's say two more because, um, two, let's say three, um, because it's already quarter past and we need to be starting the next one at 3.30. 3 so can we make them quick? Yeah, go okay, three. Uh, what, one here. Can you make it quick, brother? Yeah, sure. 
Uh, first, I would like to congratulate you for this very clear presentation. You must be an excellent professor. Uh, the question I have, well, uh, first of all, my thinking has been that in Adventism, uh, scholars are stuck on the historical approach, and that thinking came from, I think, a comment made by Ted Wilson in the Adventist World magazine, where he said that we must adhere to the historical approach to prophecy. Uh, but uh, what you presented today uh, really was quite enlightening, I would say, that Adventist scholars are open to other views. And uh, in that context, my question is, to what extent are Adventist scholars open to the futuristic view? Uh, to my understanding, the majority of the book of Revelation is futuristic. There's very little history in there. Unlike the book of Daniel, where, is, where it's about half and half, half history, which has already transpired, and the other half is futuristic, and we find that in Daniel chapter 2, chapter 7, chapter 8, chapter 9, 11, and 12. So I would like for you to answer that question, to what extent Adventist scholars are comfortable elucidating on the futuristic view that is presented in Daniel and Revelation. I'm not sure by, by what you mean by futuristic, but I'll, I'll, I'll give it a try here. Uh, and I cannot speak for everybody, but at least for the colleagues that I know and that I've dialogued with uh, through the years. Um, I, I would say that by far the large majority of Seventh-day Adventist interpreters of Daniel and Revelation understand Daniel and Revelation to be depictions of, of, of the history of God's people and of God's intervention in the life of his people uh, throughout time, whether it's Daniel or Revelation. Some chapters are or have been or are being fulfilled right now, and some chapters of Daniel or some parts of Daniel and some parts of Revelation still have to be fulfilled in the future. That is still, however, a historicist interpretation of Daniel. The word futurist tends to imply uh, what our Baptist and Pentecostal friends understand uh, with a dispensationalist understanding of Daniel and Revelation. And I, none of our Adventist scholars that I know go into that futuristic understanding of those prophecies. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Brother Engel? Yes, uh, I believe we're wrote uh, a book, The Moral Purpose of Prophecy. Is that right? The Moral Purpose of Prophecy. I think I've heard, I have not read, but I think I've, I've seen that book, yes. I think perhaps that was a reaction to, to try to, to understand, or a reaction to the historical emphasis. Yes. Which is just dealing pretty much with facts and events. Yes. And we're just trying to to answer what's the point? What's the point of all of this? Of all this. Yes. And so, and I would, and I think that's a good question, but I would ask too, what's, when we look at the Seleucids and the Ptolemies history, and, and the foundation of Daniel 11 is that history, pr pretty much, and it launches from there. What is the moral purpose of of the, the history of the historic kings of the North and South. Hmm. I would like to, someone to answer. I'm going to have to defer. I am not a specialist on Daniel, certainly not on Daniel 11. Um, I, I, I don't know. I, I can't answer. I, I, I honestly don't know. I don't know what that means. Mm -hmm. I, there is a moral, there is a moral um, meaning to prophecy. Uh, if we understand the word moral to mean trying to do a distinction between right and wrong. And yes, I mean, prophecies and scripture teaches us that there is right and wrong and that God wants to fix that one day uh, for right. eternity. Thank you so much. One last question. Our time is really pressing. Um, Roy Gain. Okay. Yeah, just regarding Dr. Skinner's question, Jerome Skinner's question about missiology. Um, exegetical 
um, the, uh, I think if you're holding on the transmitter, hold it further up. If I hold it further up like that? Okay, good. No, no, hold it further up the microphone. Oh, further up. all right. The transmitter is not transmitting. Let go. There oh, is. I see. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> it's all about electricity, um, of which I have plenty. Um, yeah, the exegetical view. Uh, what? Oh, thank you. You know, since the Reformation, there's been an emphasis on the word, and Adventists are supposed to be the people of the book. And so I think what we who are emphasizing the exegetical view are, are trying to encourage people to get back to the Bible as the guide to everything, sure. rather than speculation, have a controlled methodology. And I think that is going to bring about a much more convincing kind of evangelistic message for one thing. And for another thing, our interaction with scholars in the scholarly world at these conventions and in our, our writing and books and articles and everything, we're working on trying to influence the people who write the books, who That's translate, right. who write the commentaries, and the textbooks that then yeah. train the pastors in all the different Christian churches who then that's teach right. the people. So it seems like we're just a little few people in an ivory tower, but that has a really vast influence beyond that's right. that. That's yeah. right. So that's evangelism. I that's regard right. it's, it's, it's that way. It's a scholar evangelism that we do. Really? One more? Well, uh, yes. Okay, Martin, go ahead. Okay, um, I learned, Danny, that we study history so that we can learn for the future. So let me ask you something about the future. Uh, you have uh, given us an overview of the three periods, uh, maybe not in chronological order, as you know, but the best for the last, it seems to me. <laughs> so uh, I'm a theologian. Yeah. So you would know okay. uh, that I would perhaps favor the I, theological. I, I feared emphasis. that that would be the third one. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm an exegete by heart. But anyway, sometimes I see uh, people doing um, a reaction to the exegetical approach. They come up with more history and more theology. And it seems to me really that it is a kind of a counter reaction to this elitist approach. Yes. Only a few in the ivory tower, you heard Roy telling. Yes. Uh, they study that. You said it's complicated, it's complex. I would say, yeah, it, it's difficult. But still, if I just hear a historical identification or a theological interpretation without going to the text, I think we can do better. That's right. So let me ask you this question. As a student and scholar of history of theology, Danny, in your opinion, where should we go from here? Should we go back to a specific approach? Probably not. What would be your advice for the historians, for the theologians, for the exegetes, and in the end, for the church members? What should they look for? Oh, that's a very good question. Quispy in his book concludes that we should go back to the historical view of Uriah Smith and Mervyn Maxwell, that we should emphasize that and that we should demand that of our scholars. Uh, he's very strong. He's from South America. so, he, <laughs> And uh, that's his conclusion there at the end of his dissertation. I didn't agree with that. Uh, I, I feel that it's better to have a good uh, cross-fertilization between all three, that we, we need to have dialogues, we need to have consultations, that we need to talk to each other. I think there's certainly a beautiful place that exegesis must play in our understanding of Daniel and Revelation, and that to me, uh, then history and theology should be included in that. To me, really, it's, it's combining all three of them together. That is the best way to do this, and not necessarily uh, push for one way only. Uh, to understand these books. That's, okay. my, that's my perspective. Well, thank you very much, uh, um, Pastor Denis. We are privileged by your presentation this morning uh, and this afternoon. And uh, let's give him a round of applause. That's been a beautiful presentation. Thank you. As uh, for some of you who were with us last year, we started last year looking at the three main interpretive clusters. Those are like the outcomes. Today, we've been looking at some of the interpretive principles or approaches that we use to the text. And uh, by tomorrow, we will have our panel of scholars on the, on the platform drilling down to the actual Hebrew text itself, looking at the convergence and uh, the disagreement texts, asking why do we agree on these areas and why do we disagree on these areas. So in a sense, we are moving from the historical 
to the exegetical in this process from last year to this year, if you're going to put us in the general flow here. So we're going to take a 10-minute break now. We will gather back at 20 to 4, and then we have our final presentation. It's a discussion of the extent to which Ellen White endorsed Uriah Smith's views in the book Daniel and Revelation. Uh, thank you very much. We'll gather back in 10 minutes' time. <laughs>
So do you want that stuff on the website now? So we can let people know. Yeah. Uh, they can go to daniel11prophecy.com and they can download it. Okay. Um, and uh, yeah, I think it's, uh, you've seen all the other Uriah Smith stuff, but I don't think the conclusion changes, I agree with you. Yeah. It's suggestive, but it's not conclusive. But what you heard today about, you know, the, the uh, Uriah Smith, the, uh, the 10th of August, 1840, that scholars are moving away from it, that to me is part of the problem that's happening right now. Yeah, they shouldn't be going away from it. Yes. 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 I think so too. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I'll bring everybody back in. All right, everybody, we'd like to invite you to take your seats again. Uh, we're coming to the final session of today. Uh, today is the hors d'oeuvre and um, the appetizer. And we'll be continuing tomorrow with a detailed look at some of the Hebrew texts. Do all of you have a program like this with you? Well, um, if you look in this program uh, to the... Turn to the very middle and it says Daniel 11 Anchor and Divergence Texts. Right at the very middle of your handbook, do you see that? It says Daniel 11 Anchor and Divergence Texts. If you turn over the page from there, uh, Pastor Joe Reeves and the team here were kind. They, they published this for us and we have a list here of the key texts on the, lex, on the left. Those are the anchor texts. That's where there's general agreement among Adventist interpreters. And on the right, there are the divergence texts, like um, Daniel 11.36. Is that the rise of, of um, revolutionary France? Or is that a description of the papacy in its blasphemous phase? And so we have there a list of anchor texts and divergence texts. And that is what we're going to be going through tomorrow and Sabbath afternoon. We'll start with the anchor texts, what we can all agree on, before we move on to the text where there is significant disagreement. And we're going to be asking the questions, what in the original Hebrew language would indicate one interpretation or the other? And this is where we get down to the real nitty gritty, but we will be working through primarily these texts that are listed here. And uh, we spent some time putting that list together with the other members of the steering committee to make sure that we have captured all the key anchor texts where, where that people can agree on, and the divergence texts, the texts where there is, you know, pistols at dawn, you know, metaphorically speaking. Um, as we're theological these days, rather than literal, we don't do pistols at dawn literally anymore. So, uh, we'd like to welcome this afternoon um, our friend, uh, 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 Pastor William Fagel. Uh, he served for many years in the uh, White Estate at the General Conference, um, doing all kinds of things there. You've probably read some of his writings um, when people wrote into the General Conference asking what did Sister White say about X, Y, or Z, um, Pastor Fagel had the privilege of doing all the research and giving a very considered answer. And uh, so we're blessed by his presentation this afternoon. Uh, his presentation this afternoon is focusing on uh, the question of to what extent did Sister White endorse the book Daniel and Revelation by Uriah Smith in general, and in particular um, his teachings on the Eastern question, which is, was the heart of the, the King of the North as Ottoman Empire and so forth back in the time of Uriah Smith. So, Pastor William uh, Fagel, we're delighted to have you with us, and may God bless you as you share with us. Well, I'm pleased to be here and to be able to share in this conference with you. I'm going to stay pretty close to my notes. It'll help me to, to keep within the time frame and also uh, to avoid missing something that I meant to say and then uh, didn't think of it at just the time. So I've been asked to speak specifically on whether Ellen G. White's comments on Daniel 11 constitute an endorsement of Uriah Smith's view, especially regarding the closing verses of the chapter. I'm not an expert on the interpretation of Daniel 11, although I'm interested in the subject. But I have spent nearly half my life working for the Ellen G. White estate, full-time for 31 years and part-time for an additional four. A significant part of my work involved answering questions that came to the White estate. This often involved responding to charges by Ellen White's critics 
so I've had to think about how to interpret her writings properly and avoid drawing conclusions that may not be sustainable on other uh, subjects. I hope that I can help us collectively to think about some of these things in relation to the challenges regarding Daniel 11. Now, in presenting this study, I want to say that as far as I know, all the participants in this symposium believe that Ellen G. White was truly a prophet of God and hold her writings in high regard. If I come to different conclusions from those held by any of them, it is no assault on their devotion or integrity. We may merely be looking at the same data from somewhat different perspectives. In writing and speaking on Daniel 11 and the Eastern question, as it was called, uh, Uriah Smith understood Turkey to be the king of the north and Egypt to be the king of the south. He presented his view ably in his writings, and our evangelists of the uh, 19th and early 20th centuries preached it widely and effectively. What does Ellen White say about the Eastern question? Does she endorse Smith's view? If so, does the endorsement indicate divine verification of all of its particulars? I'm grateful for the work of some of our participants in gathering statements uh, that have a bearing on this matter. Their helpful papers have assisted me in gathering and thinking about the materials, at least insofar as I've been able to read those papers. And I, I wish I had read more, but uh, I have read uh, a number of them. Though the LNG White database has eight hits for the expression Eastern question, there are really only three distinct accounts represented there. The other five duplicate one or another of the three. So here are the three statements. Referring to the Groveland, Massachusetts camp meeting in 1877, attended by many thousands of people, Ellen White wrote, Sunday morning, the weather was still cloudy, but before it was time for the people to assemble, as the sun shone forth, uh, no, but, hmm, uh, before, yeah, I'm sorry, I misread that, but before it was time for the people to assemble, the sun shone forth. Boats and trains poured their living freight upon the ground in thousands. Elder Smith spoke in the morning upon the Eastern question. The subject was of special interest and the people listened with the most earnest attention. All right, that's the first. In 1884, a few years later now than this one, Ellen White heard Elder Smith present this subject at a camp meeting in Syracuse, New York, again with thousands in attendance. She wrote, the evening meeting was largely attended. Elder Smith spoke with great clearness and many listened with open eyes, ears, and mouths. The outsiders seemed to be intensely interested in the Eastern question. He closed with a very solemn address to those who had not been preparing for these great events in the near future. At a campground in Australia in 1898, Ellen White wrote, Elder Daniels speaks this evening upon the Eastern question. May the Lord give his Holy Spirit to inspire the hearts to make the truth plain. Now, clearly, Mrs. White was positive about these presentations. The first two statements note the people's interest and attention. The second of them noted Smith's appeal for his hearers to prepare for these great events coming in the near future. The third statement expressed Ellen White's desire for the Holy Spirit to help make the truth plain. There's no hint here of disagreement with any part of the message. We have a similar situation in her references to Smith's book, Thoughts on Daniel and the Revelation. I've compiled what I think are all of her references to that book, uh, at least by name, in an appendix to the paper that I'm sharing with you today. And her comments are uniformly appreciative, and some might even say effusive, in referring to the book without any trace of reservations expressed. In a letter to Hiram Crewe in 1904, Mrs. White did not use the expression Eastern question, but she did speak of Daniel 11. 
We have no time to lose. Troublous times are before us. The world is stirred with the spirit of war. Soon the scenes of trouble spoken of in the prophecies will take place. The prophecy in the 11th of Daniel has nearly reached its complete fulfillment. Much of the history that has taken place in fulfillment of this prophecy will be repeated. In the 30th verse, a power is spoken of that shall be grieved and return and have indignation against the Holy Covenant. So shall he do. He shall even return and have intelligence with them that forsake the Holy Covenant. And then she goes on to quote uh, verses 31 to 36, and it's not reproduced in the book that I'm drawing this from. See, see, oh yeah, I've got to change the slide here. Scenes similar to those described in these words will take place. We see evidence that Satan is fast obtaining the control of human minds who have not the fear of God before them. Let all read and understand the prophecies of this book, for we are now entering upon the time of trouble spoken of. And then she quotes Daniel 12, verses 1 to 4. Now in that passage, Ellen White wrote of no time to lose, the prophecy in the 11th of Daniel has nearly reached its complete fulfillment. She expected some items to be repeated, but she clearly believed that Daniel 11 was nearing its complete fulfillment. She wrote this letter not long after the Sabbath school lessons had covered the book of Daniel and devoted three weeks of lessons to the Eastern question, presenting the material as Smith had done so. It seems reasonable to suppose that she had Smith's interpretation in mind when she wrote this letter. Smith expected an early war in the Middle East to fulfill the final provisions of Daniel 11. And Ellen White noted in her statement that the world is stirred with the spirit of war in connection with her reference to Daniel 11's complete fulfillment. Yet, Ellen White herself apparently never directly addressed the question of the King of the North's identity, a key factor in Daniel 11. W.C. White, her son, who worked closely with her through the last half of her prophetic ministry, put it this way, I do not know of any utterance of mothers that tells us about the King of the North. The two things that most nearly approach it are the statement in Testimonies, Volume 9, page 14, and Testimonies, Volume 4, page 279. By the way, I read those to you already. Here in reporting the Danvers camp meeting, and I'm still quoting uh, W.C. White here, uh, as he says, in reporting the Dan Danvers camp meeting, she wrote, Elder Smith spoke in the morning on the Eastern question. The subject was of special interest, and the people listened with the most earnest attention. These things, says W.C. White, are not proofs, but they seem to me to be very interesting indications. W.C. White was very careful not to overstate matters. He quoted some of the same evidence that we have, but he added, these things are not proofs, but they seem to me to be very interesting indications. Not proofs, but indications. Why didn't Elder White consider them proofs? I think it may have been simply that Ellen White did not actually state what she believed the King of the North to be. Short of that, we are surmising. We are saying what we think she meant. Our surmises might be correct or not, but they are still surmises. We should carefully distinguish between the data, the facts, on which we can probably all agree, and the conclusions that we draw from the data. On those, we might have some difference of opinion. And most importantly, in interpreting Ellen White on Daniel 11, we need to follow methods that we can safely apply to other questions. So let me turn to some other questions then to illustrate my concerns for using methods that will be reliable to follow. I've had occasion to question some surmises regarding Ellen White's views concerning certain other matters. There are her few but famous amalgamation statements Notably this one, every species of animals which God had created was preserved in the ark, 
the confused species, which God did not create, which were the result of amalgamation, were destroyed by the flood. Since the flood, there has been amalgamation of man and beast, as may be seen in the almost endless varieties of species of animals and in certain races of men. Now, many of Ellen White's critics read this statement as though it said, amalgamation of man with beast. And they accuse her of believing in a now discredited 19th century idea of such crossings uh, between humans and animals, often including in the package the claim that she believed black people were the result of just such a crossing between human and animal. These interpretations are their surmises about the meaning of what she said. Of course, her own statements on the dignity and equality of the black race in relation to whites and others show that this was not her view of things. But the critics quote, no less a person than Uriah Smith in support of their claims. In his 1868 book, The Visions of Mrs. E.G. White, A Manifestation of Spiritual Gifts According to the Scriptures, Smith defends Ellen White against her critics. Among many fine replies to the critics' claims, on this one regarding amalgamation, Smith seems to accept the critics' premise that she was saying that humans had crossed with animals. And he lists three groups as possible candidates. He uh, refers to the wild Bushmen of Africa, some tribes of the Hottentots, and perhaps the Digger Indians of our own country, etc. Now, Smith is quick to assert the full humanity of these groups, but he seems to believe that they resulted from a cross between humans and animals. The critics further claim that the whites took large quantities of this book with them to sell at camp meetings and other gatherings. Nowhere does Mrs. White appear to object to the book. Are we to conclude then that she endorsed Smith's defense of her on this point? That's what the critics would have you believe. And while the critics use this information to deny the divine origin of her messages, we might look at this material from the other side and ask, does Mrs. White's lack of criticism on this point constitute a divine approval of Smith's reasoning? Such conclusions on either side are surmises, and I think they are wrong. The book as a whole is so helpful and effective a defense of Ellen White's prophetic gift that I can understand James White's promotion of it and Ellen White's not having forbidden it. And there are good reasons to see her statement as referring not to amalgamation of man with beast, but amalgamation of man and of beast, that is, two categories of amalgamation. In this very statement, I don't know if you noticed it, in this very statement, Mrs. White says that you can see the results of this amalgamation, not just in certain races of men, which the critics tend to focus on, and they never mention the other part of what she says, and that was that you can see it in the almost endless varieties of species of animals. Now, is this great variety of species of animals around us that we can see today, is that the result of crossing of humans with animals? I don't think anybody in the 19th century believed that, and nor Ellen White. It's simply not what Ellen White was saying. Now, I can't spend more time on this issue, but if you want more information, see Francis D. Nichols' book, Ellen G. White and Her Critics, and uh, you have the pages there on the screen. Um, and you, if you can't get the book, you can go online and uh, find it at egwwritings.org. And I've given you the search term you should use to take you right to the starting page, EGWC 302, okay? My point here is that we need to follow reliable methods of determining what Ellen White believed and taught. Indications and surmises are not enough for us to state, uh, to state conclusively what her belief was. But even when we can be quite sure of what her belief was, does this constitute an assurance that we know the mind of God in the matter? <laughs> 
some point to a famous statement of hers and see in it the assurance that we're seeking. She wrote, I recommend to you, dear reader, the word of God as the rule of your faith and practice. By that word, we are to be judged. God has, in that word, promised to give visions in the last days, not for a new rule of faith, but for the comfort of his people and to correct those who err from Bible truth. One important function of the gift of prophecy in the last days, they note, is to correct those who err from Bible truth. If someone is not teaching the correct Bible truth, they conclude, we can expect Ellen White to correct that person so that we will know what the Bible truth is. Now, many times she did just that, to the blessing of the individual involved and the strengthening of the church. We can rejoice in that function of the gift of prophecy. But did it always happen that way? Ellen White published this statement in her very first book, Christian Experience and Views of Mrs. E.G. White, printed in 1851 and later included in early writings. She had been a Sabbath keeper for just five years at that point and was approaching seven years as the Lord's messenger. Joseph Bates had introduced her and James White to the Sabbath, and after a time of resisting it initially, about the time they were married, they accepted the Sabbath on the basis of the Bible evidence that Bates had put into a tract. Ellen White only received a vision on the matter, confirming the Sabbath truth, seven months after they had begun to keep it on the strength of that Bible evidence. Following what Bates taught them, they kept the Sabbath from 6 p.m. on Friday to 6 p.m. on Saturday, regardless of the time of year. Bates, a sea captain, thought that they should keep the Sabbath according to sunset at the equator, which happened to be uniform year-round. But some, following the Seventh-day Baptists, were commencing each Sabbath at the local sunset time, and others began keeping it from sunrise to sunrise, based on Matthew 28, verse 1. In the end of the Sabbath, as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week. Confusion was entering the ranks. A vision given to Ellen White pointed them to the evening time. That's Leviticus 23:32. It's the Bible text that the vision pointed them to. And that corrected the morning view as an error in principle. So the visions were correcting those who err from Bible truth. But the great majority, majority of the believers continued to begin each Sabbath at 6 p.m. James White became uncomfortable with the division in the ranks. He asked the young scholar J.N. Andrews to research the matter and give the believers a report. Andrews's resulting paper was read to a conference of believers at Battle Creek, Michigan, November 17, 1855, for the Sabbath morning Bible study. Using nine Old Testament passages and two from the New Testament, the paper demonstrated conclusively that the local observed sunset was the time to begin the Sabbath. Bates had not been wrong in principle, starting the Sabbath in the evening, even connecting it with sunset, though it was at the equator. But he had been wrong in the detail. Almost everyone accepted the new understanding immediately. Two who did not were Joseph Bates and Ellen White. It was a vision, again, given at the close of the conference that corrected those who erred from Bible truth, and both of these respected leaders accepted the new understanding, and there was unity. But clearly, being the Lord's messenger did not give Ellen White instant understanding of every doctrinal error. James White addressed this matter in a review article in 1868, one that will help to inform our understanding of Ellen White's famous statement about correcting those who err from Bible truth. This is a portion of an article that James White wrote. The question, and uh, the article, by the way, was about the time to commence the Sabbath. The question naturally arises, if the visions are given to correct the erring, 
Why did she, Mrs. White, not sooner see the error of the six o'clock time? For one, I have ever been thankful that God corrected the error in his own good time and did not suffer an unhappy division to exist among us upon the point. But, dear reader, the work of the Lord upon this point is in perfect harmony with his manifestations to us on others and in harmony with the correct position upon spiritual gifts. It does not appear that, uh, to appear to be to the desire of the Lord to teach his people by the gifts of the Spirit on Bible questions until his servants have diligently searched his word. When this was done upon the subject of time to commence the Sabbath, and most were established, and some were in danger of being out of harmony with the body on this subject, then, yes, then, was the very time for God to magnify his goodness in the manifestation of the gift of his spirit in the accomplishment of its proper work. The sacred scriptures are given us as the rule of faith and duty, and we're commanded to search them. If we fail to understand and fully obey the truths in consequence of not searching the scriptures as we should, or a want of consecration and spiritual discernment, and God in mercy, in his own time, corrects us by some manifestation of the gifts of his Holy Spirit, instead of murmuring that he did not do it before, Let us humbly acknowledge his mercy and praise him for his infinite goodness in condescending to correct us at all. Let the gifts have their proper place in the church. God has never set them in the very front and commanded us to look to them to lead us in the path of truth and the way to heaven. His word he has magnified. The scriptures of the Old and New Testament are man's lamp to light up his path to the kingdom. Follow that. But if you err from Bible truth and are in danger of being lost, it may be that God will, in the time of his choice, correct you and bring you back to the Bible and save you. So according to James White, God does not desire to teach his people Bible matters by the gifts of the Spirit until they have searched the Bible for themselves as they should. Then. If they are still in error, and this puts them in danger of being lost, he may use the gifts to bring them back and save them. But he may not choose to do this with every error, but rather with ones that might lead to a loss of salvation. That's what I think I'm hearing James White say on this very statement from Ellen White that we've been examining. This tells me that we should not expect the gifts to serve as a kind of doctrinal sieve or as our urim and thummim to answer all our questions. We may rather have some hard work to do biblically to arrive at truth, and God does not want to deprive us of that privilege. But is this really how the gift of prophecy worked in Ellen White's experience? Other examples show that it is. For one, our early pioneers, including James and Ellen White, were meat eaters, and they made no distinction between the meats labeled clean and unclean in the Old Testament. Why? Hadn't they read Leviticus 11 and Deuteronomy 14? Of course they had. But at the time, they understood these matters to be simply a part of the Jewish ceremonial law. They knew from the New Testament that Jesus' death on the cross had brought the ceremonial system to an end. They reasoned that if it was necessary to keep this part of the ceremonial law, wouldn't they therefore be obligated to keep it all? And they knew that this could not be so, and so they concluded that these dietary laws did not apply to Christians. However, S. N. Haskell and his wife began to teach that the Advent people should not eat swine's flesh. Ellen White wrote to them in 1858, reproving their action, which was out of harmony with the body of believers. You can find this in Testimonies, Volume 1, pages 206 and 207. Now, she did not declare that they were theologically wrong, but she wrote, if God requires his people 
to abstain from swine's flesh, he will convict them on the matter. If it is the duty of the church to abstain from swine's flesh, God will discover it to more than two or three. He will teach his church their duty. And he did just that five years later in 1863 in the comprehensive health reform vision that he gave to Ellen White. In it, among other things, she was shown that God's people should not eat swine's flesh and that the vegetarian diet would be better still for them. While Adventists generally stopped eating swine's flesh as a result of this vision, the vision had not spoken of Leviticus 11 or Deuteronomy 14, nor mentioned unclean foods more generally. And so Adventists continued to eat them, as did Ellen White herself at rare times. It would not be until around the turn of the 20th century that the church came to consensus about the broad category of unclean foods mentioned in those Bible passages and which later became a part of our fundamental beliefs. And as far as I know, Ellen White never did receive a vision on this larger topic. This fits with James White's understanding of how God deals with such matters. The Lord in his mercy warned us by vision against the most common and perhaps most dangerous of the unclean foods that his people were eating. But he left us to study the matter in scripture to come to the full understanding. In the case we've just mentioned, apparently God did not reveal to Ellen White, nor did she perceive by her own understanding for many years the full Bible truth to which he was leading his people. In other cases though, when by revelation or study she did perceive a serious theological error, she was still not necessarily the, uh, quick to draw and fire at the offending teaching. Dr. Kellogg became enamored with pantheistic or more properly panentheistic views, which he published in his book, The Living Temple. Yet Ellen White at first made no response to this at all. She wrote, from the light given me by the Lord, I knew that some of the sentiments advocated in the book did not bear the endorsement of God and that they were a snare that the enemy had prepared for the last days. I thought that this would surely be discerned and that it would not be necessary for me to say anything about it. This indicates that we should not expect her to have spoken out on every controversy that arose especially if matters were handled appropriately through regular channels. Later, of course, she wrote extensively and passionately in opposition to Kellogg's views. But even in cases where she did speak out, she might not actually engage the false views. When Albion Fox Ballinger promoted his discordant views on the sanctuary in the early 1900s, we do not find Ellen White explaining the scriptures on the controverted points, responding to specific items on which she believed Ballinger had gone astray. Rather, we find her simply warning, for example, that our brother Ballinger is presenting theories that cannot be substantiated by the word of God, and apparently leaving it to the able Bible expositors of the church to take up the details of exegesis. Another we could mention is her references to disagreements over the meaning of the term the daily in Daniel 8, in which she asked the parties involved not to use her writings to try to sustain their positions on this point that she called minor. Her reason? I have had no instruction on the point under discussion, and I see no need for the controversy. Regarding this matter under present conditions, silence is eloquence. We should recognize that God did not give her light on every Bible text or every controversial item. If we are not finding our concerns addressed directly in her writings, it could be simply that, as she put it here, I have had no instruction on the point under discussion. I'm reminded of W.C. White's statement referenced earlier that he knew of no utterance, and I take that as written or oral, no utterance from Ellen White that tells us about the King of the North. 
the two statements W.C. White cited that in his view came closest to it, he did not take for proofs, but only as very interesting indications. His method, I believe, is sound, as borne out in other examples that I've given. So we see that the statement from Ellen White's early ministry, that the visions were to correct those who err from Bible truth, is not absolute, always taking place immediately and in every instance of error, but is a part of a bigger picture of how God leads his people. God did not reveal every error to her. And even when he did reveal an error, in some cases he delayed sending such correction until his people had done the requisite study. If in the process they resolved the error through this means, he might not use the visions to address the matter at all. So, what does all this mean for the question we raised at the start, namely, whether Ellen G. White's comments on Daniel 11 constitute an endorsement of Uriah Smith's view, especially regarding the closing verses of the chapter? I'm profoundly aware of my own fallibility here. I'm in no position to rule ex cathedra on matters such as this, or on anything else for that matter. All I can do is humbly share what I see here, laying it before you for your consideration in hopes that it may be a contribution toward our common goal of better understanding God's word and sharing it in Holy Spirit power with the world. As I think you know by now, I do not find Ellen White to have placed a blanket imprimatur on Elder Smith's views on Daniel 11 and the King of the North, giving them divine endorsement to be used uh, in opposition to other views. There is a part of me that would like it to be so, for I know the high regard that she had for Elder Smith, and I'm not inclined to set aside easily the positions that our pioneers taught. But it seems to me that we don't have a smoking gun endorsement from Ellen White of the specific views we're interested in. Her positive statements could simply indicate her appreciation for the effect of these views in leading people to prepare for what she called the great events of the near future, that is, for the close of this world's history and the coming of Jesus. Her statements do not prove that she had prophetic insight on the specific correct interpretation of these verses. She could have written as she did, even if she had, as she said in another instance here, had no instruction on the point under discussion. She may have admired the careful scholarship and tight reasoning of Elder Smith on these matters and been personally moved regarding the nearness of Jesus' coming. These seem to me to be plausible alternate explanations of her statements, though they are in no way proof of how to understand them. She may indeed have had divine light that accorded with Smith's positions, and this is what lay behind her positive statements. But with the information we have now, I do not know how to settle the matter. I believe that there is still room for study on this subject from the Bible, and that this must be our ultimate refuge. Are we in a weak position theologically if we turn away from what the church taught so widely for so many years? This may be a concern, but we do have other examples where we have made such changes. In teaching righteousness by faith, Jones and Wagoner abandoned the kind of preaching on the law that had characterized much of Adventist evangelism up to that point, which said, in effect, yes, you are saved by grace through faith if you keep the law. They recognize that as important as keeping God's law is, it is not a causative factor in salvation, but a result of God's grace working in the heart and life. But at a time when it appeared that this country was on the verge of a national Sunday law, many established leaders believed it was too late, that was their expression, too late now to change our presentation regarding so crucial a matter as the law of God, which is a key foundation for the Sabbath. But Ellen White endorsed that change. In fact, she'd been calling for it for years. And the church did adjust its message 
On another point, prominent church leaders, including Ellen White's own husband, had been outspoken opponents of the Trinity doctrine, or at least some presentations of it, since the beginning of the movement. Yet in the 1890s, Ellen White began writing things about Jesus and the Holy Spirit that must have challenged the current views. Eventually, the Church moved to what I believe is a biblically compatible doctrine of the Trinity, though some still oppose that today. My point is that the Church can come to new understandings of Bible truth. It is not bound irrevocably to the positions that others have held in its earlier years. It is not forbidden to change its teachings, but it should have solid Bible basis for doing so. This is why we have no creed. We say, the Bible is our creed. But we are not to change just because we can, or because a new view seems more in tune with the times, or for any other reason than that Scripture compels us. The Seventh-day Adventist Church turned away from Smith's view on Daniel 11, largely so at least, beginning perhaps in the 1930s, and gaining more ground in the 1940s and 50s. Smith's book, Daniel and the Revelation, was revised to reflect new views on Daniel 11. I confess that through my life, I've not seen much evidence that Turkey will take a leading role in last day events. But interestingly enough, Turkey is in the news just now, isn't it? Showing formidable military strength. There's an inherent danger in trying to interpret Bible prophecies by the events in the world news. Some 40 years ago, an Adventist scholar published an article in which he took the position that Ellen White's account of last day events and her interpretation of such things as the beast and the mark of the beast reflect not so much the end of the world, but the end of her world, the world that she knew. But Jesus did not come then when things could well have happened in just the way that she predicted. Today, he said, the world is quite different, and in his view, if I understand it correctly, uh, the outcome of Bible prophecy may be different as well. He recognized the need to reach people whose worldview differs from that of Ellen White and her contemporaries, proposing that, except perhaps in Latin America where the Catholic Church is still dominant, that church simply doesn't fit the role that Ellen White cast for it. He suggested that communism, nuclear arms, energy shortages, or ecological disorders may be among the beasts and signs unanticipated by Mrs. White and other early Adventists. That was 1979. While the Catholic Church appeared to be becoming less and less relevant on the world stage, and communism was emerging into new prominence, in only about a dozen years from that time uh, that the article was published, the Catholic Church played a key role in overthrowing the Soviet Union. And the Pope seems more and more like a world leader that the major nations will look to. On what grounds then, if that could happen, on what grounds then can we say that the King of the North role for Turkey is impossible? The old view, out of vogue though it may seem to some, could yet prove to be true. We do not know for certain what is coming. That famous theologian, Yogi Berra, once said, making predictions is hard, especially about the future. And while God clearly wants us to know the broad outlines of his plan for winding up the terrible experiment with sin that has been in progress here for some six millennia, we struggle with the details. One reason why the Eastern Question view fell out of favor is that people made predictions of what would or would not happen based on it, and some of those predictions failed. Jesus said, And now I have told you before it comes, that when it does come to pass, you may believe. We know that Jesus, we know what Jesus has said, but in some respects we may only be able to believe when it does come to pass. Then we will know for certain what he meant when we actually see the fulfillment. 
He did not give us the prophecies so that we could, in every case, predict the future, but so that we would not be disheartened when the difficult days come, knowing that he has the future in his hands. In the setting of the post-1888 controversies over righteousness by faith, Ellen White wrote the following revealing word of caution. Nothing frightens me more than to see the spirit of variance manifested by our brethren. We are on dangerous ground when we cannot meet together like Christians and courteously examine controverted points. I feel like fleeing from the place lest I receive the mold of those who cannot candidly investigate the doctrines of the Bible. Those who cannot impartially examine the evidences of a position that differs from theirs are not fit to teach in any department of God's cause. What we need is the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Without this, we are no more fitted to go forth to the world than were the disciples after the crucifixion of their Lord. Jesus knew their destitution and told them to tarry in Jerusalem until they should be endowed with power from on high. In our controversies today, we must bring the right spirit to our discussions, to examine impartially positions that differ from our own in a courteous and Christ-like spirit, attitude. For this, according to Ellen White, we need the baptism of the Holy Spirit. This baptism supersedes the importance of whether any one side in the controversy wins or loses. So how shall we proceed? With earnestness, yes, even zeal, but with kindness and grace, seeking the baptism of the Holy Spirit. May God make this real in our lives. As we seek the truth in His way and His Spirit, He may bring us to that unity for which Jesus prayed. Thank you very much, uh, Pastor Fagel. Uh, okay, questions or comments? Um, if I were to surmise my takeaway, Pastor Fagel, of your presentation, it is that Sister White's comments on the Eastern question are suggestive but not conclusive. Uh, that would be, if I, just my takeaway from that would be a fair a summary? Yes, yes. Okay. Okay, well, thank you. So, do you have any feedback or, yes, um, Brendan here and then Roy. All right, this works here. Okay. Um, thank you very much for that. Uh, the comment sort of question uh, is a comment, but I want to know if there's any further that you could um, enlighten on it. I, I understand that she endorsed several different things in her lifetime. She endorsed her husband as being someone who received light from God, but that doesn't mean that everything that he said she agreed with. She endorsed O.R.L. Crozier's uh, sanctuary pamphlet. And the reason I bring that one up is because it differed on the daily with Uriah Smith's book, which she also appears to have endorsed. Mm -hmm. And so this, uh, and, and then she endorsed the 1843 um, chart, which some people, uh, besides one mistake, she mentions a mistake, but there are other mistakes that we could tell from history and even from her writings. When we have a, several different things that she's endorsed, that are in conflict with each other, shouldn't that suggest that the endorsements are more functional in the sense that they, they achieved a good work in spite of flaws? And do you know of any other things that she has endorsed? I know like Pilgrim's Progress and things like that, which were, not, were, were themselves imperfect and she didn't necessarily qualify her endorsement. Well, those are helpful observations. I have not given thought to that specific question, and right off the bat here, I, I don't have another one to add to your list. But, um, but that is a, a, a helpful thing to remember, that uh, the, the positive statements that she makes about um, many such things may be general rather than uh, you know, specific to every point in it. 
like you were saying about the Eastern question, it was because it was getting people to think about the future, not necessarily yeah. every single thing that he said. I mean, if you, if you look at it just from a macro point of view, uh, Uriah Smith's uh, understanding of Daniel and Revelation is probably, if you take out Daniel 11, you've still got a lot that we would have in common with him as Adventists today. Um, e even our scholars today would support a lot of his conclusions. So it's not like we've, you know, we've chucked out the whole book because we dis differ, even on Daniel 11, we agree with him up to a certain point. And same with the Eastern question. If, if, that, if those sermons covered Daniel 11, as I'm sure they didn't just cover the last verses, he would have had to have arrived at that point mm -hmm. by giving the background. There still would have been a lot of truth. When I look at, you said the facts, she actually, her observations on those three statements on the Eastern question, she said, all that she's observing is people were interested and she made a general, in one of them, a general sentiment of, I, I, uh, you know, may the Lord make the truth, bring, bring the truth to the, to the hearer's ears. Yes. That's, those, those things are not an imprimatur, as, you, as, as you've said. They're just her observations, hey, people, people were interested, and I hope people get the most out of it. That's, yeah. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Yes. Uh, Brother Roy? Well... Yeah, along those lines, doesn't the Bible in Hebrews 11 mention a lot of people as people of faith who did great things? And when we look at the list of those people, uh, Gideon and David and Samson and all those people, uh, Barak and Jephthah, uh, they're pretty imperfect. Um, and didn't Ellen White say really good things about Martin Luther and sort of endorse him and also William Miller? And uh, years ago, I read um, William Miller's 15 proofs, quote, proofs for 1844, and I concluded, well, um, about 13 and a half of them we would no longer consider valid, but the one and a half is, is enough to establish it. That's good enough. That's all we need. Um, so, but my question is about uh, the, the, the so-called daily, and uh, you pointed out that she said she never got light on that, but there's one statement, and I was just trying to find it now, where she seemed to endorse William Miller's view in the sense that she said, we were better off when we were unified under William Miller and his view on the, on the daily, which was paganism, and we were better off when we were unified on that. Now, I t a lot of people take that as an endorsement that he was right on that, that therefore the Tamid, uh, Hatamid in Daniel is paganism, but I don't see that that's what she's saying, and I just wanted to run this by you. I see her saying, it's better to be unified and wrong on a minor point than tearing each other apart over a minor point if somebody's right and somebody's wrong. D does that make sense? I haven't looked at that specific point, but what you have just said makes sense to me. Uh, I, I, could, I could see her um, expressing that kind of uh, wish for the church, that we, that we pull together and, as you say, not be tearing each other apart. Oh, and I want to comment on that, having preached on that recently. It's not just the daily, it's the law in the book of Galatians that she calls minor too. So there, there is this dynamic of wanting to get out of the room when the wrong spirit's there. So yeah. the law in the book of Galatians and the daily were both considered called by her direct verbiage minor points. Okay, and then we'll go to our sister back there after Brother Tim. And here's Ellen White about the King of the North being a minor point. I get this from Arthur White's letters, I can f found it on the White Estate, about the discussion between Uriah Smith and James White from the 1877 camp meeting and their disagreement. Uriah said it's Turkey, James says it's the papacy. And it was a public disagreement. And there's a fairly lengthy letter here, it's written in 1966. And he, Arthur White says, we have one published reference in the writings of Ellen White to this experience, although it is not named. If you will turn to Council to Writers and Editors, page 6, 76 and 77, you will find this material under the side heading, differing views on minor points. Please read this carefully because it brings to view points much more important than the rightness or wrongness of the views held by the men on these minor points. And the statement is, differing views on minor points. My husband had some ideas on some points differing from the views taken by his brethren. I was shown that however true his views were, God did not call for him to put them in front before his brethren and create difference of ideas this was an evangelistic meeting he did this in front of. Mm. While he might hold these views subordinate himself, once 
they are made public, minds would seize upon them, and just because of others believe differently would make these differences the whole burden of the message and to get up to contention and variance. So here's an interesting thing. Ellen White sees the king of the north as a minor point. It could be either the papacy or Turkey, and the king of the north is more important than the king of the south, so that's even less of an important point. <laughs> Keep all that in mind in our discussions. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you, uh, sister back here. Then we'll come to our friend from Colorado. You too. Uh, yes, lady on the right. Yeah, thank you, Pastor. Okay. Uh, firstly, I <laughs> wanted to say that I appreciate that you tied the entire presentation with the fact that we need the Holy Spirit. Um, while I'm um, listening and I'm reading along with you all the comments from Ellen White, one thing I'm picking up is that she had a balance. Um, she knew to that it was okay that knowledge was going to increase so I can speak and I can have knowledge about this right now but I can leave space for whoever is to come um, and she also seemed to always make things relevant to to today or well to her today to her time so my question is more along how do we well not so much me but all the lovely scholars in here <laughs> make Daniel 11 and Daniel 9, well, both, relevant to today, to our congregation today, um, the way that she did, or even make Ellen White relevant to us today. Um, because the truth is, most millennials and generation under that, um, when there's a Daniel conference or anything like this, they're not rushing to find out. And when I'm looking at how everything in the world were just getting worse, but people seem to be so comfortable, like we don't have this alarm anymore that I need to know what's happening in Daniel because I want to know where I'm living and how I'm living right now and Jesus is coming again. There isn't that, um, almost like there isn't that fear anymore, that desire to know more anymore. How do we make, how do we come and make this relevant to today? I, that's more that's a very good question, sister. And Pastor William? I think that's really what a conference like this is for, to not simply to wrestle through what the, what the solution to the, the textual issues may be, but to think about how this really, why this matters, okay? What, uh, what it says to people today and, uh, and to young people, but not just young people, um, anybody. Just having um, oh, certain uh, statements of truth that we can say, yes, that's true, um, is of value, I suppose, but, but if it is not used for, for something, for some purpose, uh, then it isn't realizing its full potential. And so as we study together here about these things, we need to be searching not only for the solution to the, the question of what does this mean, but also for the question, how does this apply? What does it say to us? How can, why, how can it change our lives and the lives of the people around us? Uh, that's, I think, what I see as a, a purpose for these kinds of discussions that we're having here. Yeah, uh, sister, there was a, a Romanian church leader who went through Ceausescu's regime in, in uh, Romania and suffered in the prison system there. And when he came to America, he made the comment that in his experience, 95% of Christians will survive physical persecution with their faith intact. On the other hand, 95% of Christians will not survive with their wealth intact when they, with their faith intact when they experience wealth. Mm -hmm. And maybe it is that in the West where nothing matters anymore, you can be what you want to be, think what you want to be, be a dream of who you want to be tomorrow or yesterday, where there are no absolutes in life anymore and you're never called to, to, um, to stand for your faith really in, in any way. Um, we are being overwhelmed not by physical persecution, but by the persecution of wealth. And my experience in other parts of the world is if you meet with Christians in, in many countries of the world, there is a keen interest in prophecy, 
because when you go through struggling, you need to know that God is still in control. But when nothing hurts you in any way, shape, or form, you have, why do you need to have that assurance? Yes, sister. Um, yeah, we'll come to our next comment. P brother here. I think this is somewhat related. I've been coming across the idea more frequently that Ellen White's writings are good for devotional purposes, but since she wasn't a theologian, a historian, or a scientist, that she, we need to be careful about accepting what she says on that, as any, uh, or that she's authority on, on, those, on those issues. Now, are, are we moving that direction so that we could say that or some people are, are accurate in saying that uh, her writings are good for just devotional purposes? Well, I, for one, don't want to go there. Uh, that's not what I would uh, say about Ellen White. Uh, I've certainly found her writings to be valuable for devotional purposes, but I think they're, they're much more than that. Uh, the, the writings that she has left to us and the messages that she gave while she was alive uh, have, have guided this church in, in profound ways. Uh, they have taken us down paths that we would not have gone, whether that's in health or in uh, evangelism or ministry to others in, in different ways. They're, they have affected our church for the good profoundly. And uh, that isn't just because they made us feel good in devotional readings. Um, they have challenged us uh, in our, our behaviors. Uh, the testimonies are, are often uh, rather pointed uh, toward uh, people's individual failings, and they are there in the testimonies because those people were not isolated in, in having these problems. There are others that have them too, and uh, we can benefit from reading those things today. Uh, it's hardly devotional reading, but, um, but it is, it's challenging and, and worthwhile. Uh, anyway, okay. there are lots of, lots of um, uh, very positive contributions that Ellen White's writings have made to this church, and uh, I would not want to just relegate her to the back seat of devotional uh, writer. Okay, thank you. Uh, Brother Hay, your name? Yes, I'm Odika Walker, student uh, AU. I would just like to say thanks for the presentation. Uh, one of my takeaway from this presentation is the fact that Ellen White's response to those issues that you have highlighted would indicate that God was not using the gift of prophecy to replace the need to search the scriptures carefully. Uh, and, I, and, I, and I think that, um, that that's, that's, that's a very you know, solid point to, to take away. In addition to that, uh, as we study the Bible carefully about these questions, we should not hold those proposals that we have formulated uh, as, as final. So we need to constantly be taking our proposal back to the Bible to see how they line up, how they, they match what the Bible is saying. So as we study together, let us just bear those in, things in mind. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, brother. Amen. Brother Hugo Leon here. Um, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Fagel. I just wanted to ask you about the great controversy statement where Ellen White says that Josiah Litch's prediction of the fall of the Turkish Empire was a fulfillment of prophecy. There's been some controversy as to how to interpret that. I'd like to hear your opinion. I'm, I'm aware that uh, there are some who are questioning that today. I am not among them. Um, I, I, I take that, uh, that statement of hers at face value, and it looks to me like it is true. And uh, so that's where I am on it. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I look through the book Great Controversy, and she makes some statements in there, and I don't see any reason to, to turn my back on those statements. Um, I, see the, I see the fulfillment of the 391 years and 15 days as happening in 18, uh, 1840. Um, and I think when that happened, there was a huge increase of people joining the Adventist church because they saw this as a fulfillment of prophecy. 
and I don't see anything in any of our scholars' writings today that would that would undermine that fulfillment of prophecy. When it actually happens to the day, I, I don't think we should be giving that up. All right, we have a sister over here, yes. Yeah, this time it's just a comment. It'll be short, my last one. Um, I wanted to say, um, what I think that we should do, just going back to my comment from earlier, um, I believe you all, probably you already are, but maybe we should connect more with the education system, our education system. Um, start with kids even as young as preschool age. Let's start finding ways, how do we reach them? How do we introduce this to them? Get with some, and then find the people who have that talent for teaching. I've been blessed that I've had Dr. Gain and Dr. Skinner, but I know not everyone has that talent for teaching. But start asking those questions. How can we get everyone to learn about this and understand the severity of the time that we live in today? Um, that was. I think that's a very fair comment, sister. And I think everybody in this room who's a parent or a grandparent would resonate exactly with your sentiments and that desire. Yes, Brother Brendan? Just kind of coming back to the, the endorsement of uh, Daniel and the Revelation a bit more. The, the, one of the quotes that you presented is actually from, the, from Ellen White about, Dan, uh, about Daniel 11, is at odds with uh, Uriah Smith. She said, she talks about a power that is referred to, and then she quotes, and you didn't have the quote, because it it's, it's just in um, mm. square brackets. Yeah. And it, it had from verse 31 to 36. Now Uriah Smith in verse 36 says it's a different power to the one in verse, up, up to verse 35. So she, in her own statement, would disagree with Uriah Smith. That's another example of where a general uh, endorsement would not be every specific. Yeah. And for, for people who do take that idea that she's endorsing him in, total, in, in totality, they either have to accept a, a, an anti-Trinitarian view as well, because his book w didn't have the understanding that the church currently has on the, the Trinity, or if they can admit to a single mistake, then they should be able to critically, under you know, go through every single statement that he has and weigh it the way that we do every, every other truth. Mm -hmm. So it seems to me that either you've got to be 100% it's an endorsement, as soon as you admit to any, you know, error, on his part, then everything is open to uh, the same scrutiny as anything else. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, uh, any final comments here? No. Well, um, thank you, Pastor Fagel. Thank you for sharing this with us. It was very thoughtful. Uh, his presentation is on the Daniel 11 Prophecy website. You can download it for yourselves. The text, not the PowerPoints, we'll hopefully get those up later, but. The actual text is up there of the presentation. Uh, you can take this and examine it for yourselves at your own leisure later on. That draws us to a close for today. And uh, we will be uh, beginning tomorrow morning at 8.30 with a season of prayer. And then at 9 o'clock, we will have our panel of scholars up at the front there. We'll be looking through the actual Hebrew text and why do we interpret some things the way we do and why do we disagree on some of those texts what in the text, in the vocabulary, in the syntax, in the structure of the sentence would lead to one interpretation or the other. We're getting down to the nuts and bolts, you might say. And um, uh, for those of us who are not Hebrew scholars, uh, I'm not a Hebrew scholar, so I'm going to ask some questions that maybe somebody wants to ask in the audience. Um, so we want to make this accessible to everybody. Uh, Brother Gain, Roy Gain will have up on the screen some, some um, computer um, school, um, computer tools, um, some software, so that we can see what we're talking about as we go through the conversation. Uh, this is an educational process for all of us, but it's also a chance for us to burrow down deeply and look at the nuts and bolts. Yes. 8.30 uh, Eastern Standard Time. And um, we will begin at 8.30 with a season of prayer. And uh, then we, at 9 o'clock, we'll have our panel of scholars and we'll continue all through tomorrow looking at these anchor texts and these divergence texts. And uh, I'm sure that we're going to be blessed by that process.
Uh, it's going to stretch us. Uh, we're going to grow. But God has blessed his church with um, scholars, and uh, we should spend some time listening and, and hearing what, what convictions God has laid on their hearts. So thank you very much, everybody. I would like to thank Pastor Kelly again and the Village Church uh, for the meal we've had today. Thank you so much, Pastor Kelly, and for graciously hosting our conference here again. And uh, the members of our steering committee, that's Pastor Kelly, uh, Dr. Roy Gain, myself, uh, Dr. Michael Juncker, just endoctored, as we say, uh, just became a doctor uh, just a few weeks ago. Congratulations. And uh, we also have Pastor Ivan Myers from California and Pastor John Whitcomb, uh, who unfortunately is not with us today. So the steering committee has put a lot of work in to coordinate this whole event here. We'd like to thank all the members of our steering committee. Let's bow our heads and close the day with prayer. Oh, Heavenly Father, oh, we thank you for the gifts that we have seen on display today. Father, we thank you for the gifts of knowledge, the gifts of wisdom, the gifts of discernment, and the gifts of prophecy. But Father, may we never forget that these gifts are given for the building up of your body. And so Father, as we go from this place today, I pray that our conversations with each other, our prayers with you, will all be focused on how can we build up your body, how can we edify your body and prepare your body for what lies ahead. Lord, may we be faithful in the convictions you have laid upon our hearts today. May we be wise in what we say and what we speak and what we share. And may all that we do be perfumed with the aroma of the presence of Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Dismiss us now with your blessing and bring us back tomorrow safely. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.